attorneys, deputy district attorneys on behalf of the state, we are outside the presence of our jury. All right, so a matter of time. So, Your Honor.
counting the jurors on present and accounting for it. We are back on the record in C-250-966, State of Alabama, Mr. Thomas Randolph. In the record, Mr. Randolph is present as attorney, deputy district attorney on behalf of the state. Do both parties speak to the presence of our jury? Yes, Your Honor. We do. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, welcome. Thank you very much for, the, for showing back up today. I know it's been a long time. We're getting there again, I swear. All right. State, you may call your next witness. Dr. Gavin. I do. Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Lisa Gavin, L-I-S-A-G-A-V-I-N. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, Dr. Gavin, how are you employed? I am a forensic pathologist, medical examiner here in Clark County. And um, what does that mean you do? I do uh, autopsies or medical legal death investigations on sudden and unexpected deaths here in Clark County as well as uh, several adjacent counties. And what is your educational background and training that allows you to work uh, in, your, in that capacity? I went to medical school at the University of Connecticut School of Medicine. I did a pathology residency at Hartford Hospital in Connecticut. I did a surgical pathology fellowship at Hartford Hospital in Connecticut. I did a forensic pathology fellowship at the Office of the Medical Investigator in New Mexico, and then I came here to Clark County. I have a medical license to practice in the state of Nevada, and I'm board certified in anatomic pathology and forensic pathology. And what, what is forensic pathology? Uh, in general, uh, forensic pathology is a division of pathology overall, and it's a group of physicians that are pathologists who also specialize in doing medical legal death investigations, so both the medical and some of the legal aspects of investigating why someone has died and the manner in which they have died. And in your, um, in your work at the Clark County Medical Examiner's Office, um, how many autopsies do you think you've conducted over the years? Uh, probably close to 4,000, 4,500 or so. And um, in that capacity, have you been called upon um, to render an opinion as an expert in the area of forensic pathology? Yes. Now, can you just give us a general overview of the process by which an autopsy is conducted at the Clark County Medical Examiner's Office? Uh, in general, the kind of medical legal death investigation begins with the identification of the body itself. And then that body will be uh, called into our office, and then our investigators will triage the call and then uh, determine whether or not the case kind of falls under our jurisdiction. If it does fall under our jurisdiction, then they will go out to do their own investigation of that body, that body as evidence. And during that investigation, they will take photographs, document anything that they see, and then place the body into a body bag. And then that body bag is then transported to our office. Uh, generally, uh, when the body is uh, considered to be in a suspicious circumstance, that body bag may be sealed. And that's when the two eyelets of the body bag come together. And then those uh, eyelet zippers are kind of sealed with a plastic seal through those eyelets and it's clamped in place. And then generally a photograph is taken of it intact at the scene and then intact when it arrives into the office. Uh, then we begin what we call kind of a processing of the body where the body will then be photographed in layers i like to say as the body is represented as it's brought in in the body bag and then if there's any uh, clothing or anything like that that'll be removed and then the body will be photographed and then if the body is dirty in any way it'll be cleaned and then the body will be photographed again and then in that process any identification of any types of injuries or the like will also be photographically documented uh, during that process, uh, a forensic technician is usually doing those photographs, and then usually law enforcement may be there simultaneously following us, doing their own photographs at the same time, and gathering any trace evidence that they may need during that process. 
Uh, likewise, the forensic pathologist may come in during that process and start to observe what's on the body. And then the forensic pathologist will also do a kind of a detailed examination of the body externally. And then the process will be to move on to the internal examination, which is classically what people think of as the autopsy process itself. And um, at the Clark County Medical Examiner's Office, are um, case numbers assigned to each autopsy case? Yes, so each of those cases, as soon as uh, the body is identified and determined to be our jurisdiction, uh, the body will be given a case number and anything associated with that uh, case and that in investigation will be associated with that number, including uh, photographs and any kind of reports. Okay, and um, then all reports, I think I heard you say all reports, photographs, radiographs, toxicology, all those reports would be um, filed essentially under that same case number? Oh, that's correct. So anything associated with the case will be filed under that case number. Okay. Um, and in, um, in your capacity as a medical examiner, have you been called upon to review cases and um, render opinions based on your, what you've reviewed in court? Yes. Um, even cases where you weren't the person who performed the autopsy? Yes. And is that just because doctors move around or? Yeah, some doctors may die, uh, some doctors may retire, uh, some day doctors may move to other jurisdictions as well, and you're not able to have them uh, come back in terms of timing to be able to do testimony. Uh, so there's a, often a cause for uh, an in-house uh, doctor to uh, render an opinion on an autopsy case that's been performed by another uh, forensic pathologist. And is that an unusual circumstance for you to testify on an, about an autopsy that you didn't personally conduct? No. Um, in, uh, well, let me ask you this. In terms of uh, an autopsy amongst medical examiners, can you explain what's meant by the term anatomical position? Yes, uh, the anatomical position would be uh, as if the body is uh, standing, if you will, with the feet flat on the floor, the arms are down at the side, and the palms are facing forward. So that would be the anatomical position of the body. Uh, obviously, in most situations, people are more dynamic, and they're moving their arms, limbs, and bending their body, so they may not be in that exact position. But in general, the forensic pathologist will use that anatomical position to describe uh, body locations. And is that used in your field as sort of a reference point um, in order to describe injuries? Yes. And um, then it would be the the reference point for like injuries of like on the left side or right side, that type of thing, or yes. up or down? Uh, yes, and it would be relative to that individual's left side, that individual's up or down. Okay. Um, can you explain, before we start getting into the autopsies in this case, can you explain to the members of jury what soot or stippling is? Uh, soot is uh, related to uh, the gunpowder that may be present within a projectile as it's uh, coming out of the barrel and then also coming out from the uh, kind of the projectile portion, uh, the jacket portion of the projectile as it's being propelled out of the weapon. Uh, so that soot material generally can burn off before that projectile hits a target, but if the projectile and the muzzle of the weapon are close to each other, you have less likelihood that that soot is going to burn off before it reaches the target area. So the closer that it is, the muzzle area is to the actual target, the more likelihood you are to see some soot on that target, the target often being, in my case, the skin surfaces. Uh, likewise, there's also some gunpowder particles that can be in there, again, helping to uh, propel the projectile. And those gunpowder particles, depending on how far apart the muzzle is from the target, the target being the skin, the gunpowder particles may or may not have time to burn off before they reach that point. If the gunpowder particles do not have time to burn off before they impact on the target, then you're going to see what's called stippling, these kind of burn abrasions on the skin surface uh, because the muzzle has been closer to the target, the target being the skin, such that they haven't had time to burn off before they get there. Okay, so soot and stippling are um, artifacts or things that you observe at autopsy in the case of gunshot wound cases? Correct. And soot would be... Um, just a, like a closer range shot that you would see maybe on the skin, like a, a dark staining? Yes. And then stippling would be the particles of um, gunpowder actually burning the skin? 
it kind of burns or abrates into the skin and creates what we call stippling. Okay. Now, what is how close does the barrel need to be to the skin in order for you to see those things? It different differs depending upon the weapon and depending on the ammunition. So in general, we have general ranges that we can use for most uh, like handguns or rifled type weapons versus shotguns. Uh, so in general, you, when a muzzle is at least uh, 24 inches or so away from the target of the skin, you're not likely to see any of the above. You're not likely to see any soot. You're not likely to see any stippling. As you start to get closer to the skin surface, the skin being the target, you're more likely to see it. So if you have something that's in a contact range, you're more likely to see that soot material deposited either on the skin or within the underlying tissues. And then the further that you get from that uh, increases or decreases the likelihood of seeing it in the, on that target zone. So as you're closer to the area of the skin, say at least within six inches, you're more likely to see that kind of uh, soot area and you may or may not see that stippling. Uh, you're, you're more likely to see it at the closer that you are. And then as you start to pull away from that area and get passed into those 24 inches or beyond, you're less likely to see it. Again, it all depends upon the gun and the ammunition that's being used. Okay. So you typically don't see soot or stippling in... Um cases where the, the muzzle and the target are two feet or greater away? In general, yes. Okay. And is there any, like, any indication once you get to that 24 inches, you know, 36 and beyond, is there any way to determine distance once you get out of that two-foot range? No. Okay, so if you're beyond that, it's it's un, it's not something that you can look at medically? No, it's very unlikely that you will, again, it, depending upon the gun and the uh, ammunition. Okay, and so in the closer range, sometimes you'll see soot or stippling um, on an injury, and that will indicate a closer range. Yes. Now, are there um, things that um, block the soot or stippling from depositing on the body? It depends. Somebody may have clothing. If somebody has more substantial hair, for example, those different things can kind of pick up the, that soot and or those gunpowder particles before it even gets onto the skin surface. So you can have areas where you don't see any if there was some clothing in that area. So you may see a, a demarcation line, for example, between where stippling is or isn't on the body based on what they might be wearing. Likewise, they could be in an environment where something is blocking uh, blocking them, um, like a, a car or a glass or something like that, where you end up going to have an intermediary target that is really going to be struck by the projectile and all of those gunpowder particles and stippling, such that it's not going to hit that individual, even though it's fairly close. Okay. Now, in preparation for your testimony this afternoon, um, did we ask you to review uh, materials associated with autopsies of Sharon Randolph and Michael Miller? Yes. And... Did you do uh, what you described earlier, pulling all the case files on both of those autopsies? Yes. And you reviewed the, the photographs, the reports, the toxicology, and anything associated with that? Yes. Um, I'd like to talk to you um, first about the autopsy of um, Sharon Randolph. And may I approach, Your Honor? Yes. of, well, I'll ask you to look through a series of photographs. This is, um, that's 250, 251, 252, 253, 254, 255, 256, 257, 258, 259, and then one last one, which is not in order, and that's 190. Um, do you recognize all those photographs? I didn't see the front of them. I saw mostly okay. the back. Yes. <laughs> Sorry about that. Mm -hmm. Judge, for the record, we don't have any objection to any of the autopsy photos. Okay. So we'll and, um, Your Honor, I um, just would want to advise, this, these are somewhat graphic photos that we're going to see, both okay. of these autopsy photos. Okay. Do you have the number of it is um, 250 through, what's that last one there, 259, and then um, the other one is 190, Your Honor.
Are those some of the photographs um, taken um, at the autopsy of Sharon Randall? Yes. Um, and are they a fair and accurate representation of the injury that she suffered? Yes. I'm going to put on the overhead um, first what's been admitted as States 250. Are you able to see that on your screen, Doctor? I am not. Oh. Yes. Okay. Um, looking at um, 250, um, can you tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury, please, what, what we're seeing in this photograph? You're seeing in the background the black body bag in which the decedent is, and then you can see the zippers that are part of that body bag, and then the through the eyelets is a little blue uh, plastic uh, seal that goes through those eyelets. Additionally, you can see what will become the toe tag that's there, um, uh, kind of partially attached to that seal area. And then also you'll see a marker that's a gray card. Uh, on both the toe tag and the gray card is the Clark County Coroner case number that's associated with this particular case, uh, and likewise the information. So this is when the body arrives into the forensic division, demonstrating that the evidence, evidence being the body, is intact upon arrival. Okay, and then the, so the Clark County case number is that gray card 083898? Correct. And um, I think there's, when we move on to other photographs, but I, there's a mouse there if you need to be more specific in, your direct, in, in what you're directing. Okay, I'm now putting on the overhead states 251. Let me back up just a little bit. What are we looking at in that photograph? Uh, this is one of the final photos that we take. It's after we've done all of our processing and we consider this like an identification photo where we've cleaned up uh, the decedent's face, uh, wash them, and then uh, put our obviously our case number card uh, next to their face. So we consider this to be like an identification photo. And next I'm putting on the overhead 252. Can you see that or do you want me to move it any particular way? Uh, I can. Uh, so in this case, uh, this is looking at the uh, decedent's right ear and the right side of her head and obviously there's some blood within the photo so this is prior to her being cleaned up and prior to uh, the area of injury being uh, shaved uh, within that uh, area of her hair is how do i get it to okay thank you so much uh, is an area of injury uh, within the uh, right parietal scalp that is within the area of her hair. So is it like like on this area on her head, like above her? Yes, yeah, so her, you can see where the top of her ear is uh, here. And so just like on yourselves, it's up on the side of the head uh, adjacent to that area of um, the scalp, if you will, above the ear. I'm next putting on the overhead um, states 253. Um, I did the trash, and then what's... Okay. Yes, ma'am. Technology. All right. So this is 253. Um, what are we looking at in this photograph? Uh, this is uh, after we have started to clean off some of the blood from that area and before we've kind of reapproximated the wound or even shaved the area. And uh, the wound is uh, fairly uh, large in, in its perspective here. And then I think you um, said that after, or typically what's done is the area of the wound um, is shaved? That's correct. I'm next putting on the overhead states. Oh, sorry, 254? Yeah. Okay, this is 254. 
So this is now that we've shaved the area to be able to reveal the details of the wound itself. And this is an entrance gunshot wound to the uh, right parietal scalp area. And how are you able to tell that this is a, a gunshot wound? Like what characteristics are you looking at as a medical examiner? It has uh, some features where it will have an abrasion at one edge. And then uh, when you have a um, muzzle or a gun that's put up to the surface of the skin, uh, those gases and things that we've kind of referred to already don't have much room to go. And so because of that, they can get underneath the scalp surface and then cause what, cause what is called radiating lacerations. And so you'll see some evidence of these lacerations extending out from the wound as well. Now, are you able to tell if there's soot or stippling in this uh, injury or on this photo? Uh, one of the other... Uh, photos, and I don't remember which exhibit it is, has a little bit of the fragment of the projectile on it. Um, you can see it in within the tissues that's kind of falling out of there. Okay. And then also you can see uh, a lot of uh, forensic pathologists will actually take sections of this to be able to look at under the microscope. And Dr. Benjamin did do that on this case and also identified that there was soot there uh, as well. And you could see it in some of the other photographs uh, too. I'm not sure we have those in this particular exhibit. Okay, let me move on. <clears throat> This is States 255. Is that oriented right, or do you want it a different? Uh, that'll work. Okay. What are we looking at there? Uh, so here now we've removed the scalp forward and back. Uh, uh, so we cut behind the ears and then reflect the scalp forward and back, and then we're able to look at the skull surface. And then in here you can see this uh, portions of the bone has... Uh, internal beveling and she has a, a slight uh, what we call keyhole defect where you partly see some external beveling associated with it too. Um, so sometimes depending upon the angle of the projectile as it enters into the skull, you can end up having part of the bone fracture outward and have that external beveling where I have that kind of circle red line or semicircle red line next to. And as well, you can have the internal beveling that you see, which is beveling of the bone inward. The inward occurs as the projectile is going in and kind of pushes inward and then therefore has like more of a cone shaped inside into the skull. So if, if we were to find... Um pieces of tissue from Sharon Randolph um, at a crime scene that wouldn't surprise you given the nature of this injury. Uh, correct. And as you can see from one of the first exhibits we put up, that a portion of the wound had uh, brain matter coming out of it. And there's actually one of the pictures actually has a small little uh, like metal fragment there that's part of the fragment of the projectile too. Next I'm putting on the overhead states uh, 256. What are we looking at in that photograph? Uh, we, uh, we obviously do an examination of the entire body and so we also do an external examination of the torso areas and then open up the body to examine all of the organs as well. Uh, and this is uh, looking at a small uh, contusion or bruise that's on the abdomen uh, and it's uh, very faint. It's kind of a uh, yellow brown in color, so it's uh, probably an older healing contusion. Okay. And then this is, uh, I'm going to put on States 257. That's obviously her arm. Yeah. Uh, correct. This one doesn't project as well. It's actually a little bit easier to see in the actual photograph, but there is a contusion that's on her forearm as well. Uh, again, a uh, minor contusion. And this is States 258. Uh, again, same thing here. This one doesn't project as well, but there is a minor contusion that's on her knee as and uh, non-fatal, just a simple bruise. And you said a contusion was, um, it's a bruise? A contusion is a bruise. Okay, these are fairly, these are minor normal bruises that maybe people would have just day-to-day -day life? Yes. Um, and I think you said one of them appeared to be healing, so there's no indication um, that they're, like they may not be contemporaneous with that. They could be from a day earlier or a couple days before? Yes. Okay. Um, I want to 
put on the overhead next um, states 190. That I would call that an X-ray. What do you What do you call that? Uh, yes, we do uh, X-rays, uh, radiographs on nearly all of our decedents that come in, particularly those that may be uh, involved in gunshot wound uh, cases. And then this is an, a lateral X-ray, and it demonstrates the uh, projectile uh, fragments that are uh, retrieved uh, during the autopsy procedure uh, within the radiograph itself. Additionally, you could see some metallic portions of personal effects in the radiograph uh, too. I believe those are maybe some earrings that are there. Okay. And uh, in addition, you can also see that there is uh, at least a fr one fracture demonstrated within this radiograph. Uh, there are others that were photographed uh, in the autopsy process. Now, those um, fragments, projectile fragments that you just talked about, those are typically recovered um, at autopsy? Yes. Okay. Next, I'm going to put on the overhead states 259. And what is that? Uh, these are the uh, projectile and the jacket fragments that were recovered during the autopsy procedure. And obviously this projectile broke apart? Yes. Now, um, in, a, in conjunction with the um, autopsy, is a toxicology uh, done on uh, individuals as they present at autopsy? Yes. And how is it a blood draw or how is that done? Uh, generally, we do it when the body is opened and take blood from the uh, vessels, the veins, particularly within the uh, body cavity. Okay. And what was her toxicology, if you recall? Uh, it was negative for common drugs of abuse and negative for ethanol. Okay. So essentially, what, what it was her cause of death? A gunshot wound of head. And are you able to give us any sense of trajectory on her injury or, or how the projectile moved through her body? Uh, yes, uh, it moved from right to left and upward. There isn't too much deviation uh, front to back or back to front. Okay, so sort of across her head. Yes. Um, and the manner of her death? A homicide. Now, if you suffered this, this type of injury, um, what would be the effect on the individual immediately? I assume it would be immediately incapacitating. Is that fair? The injury to the brain is significant, uh, such that someone would be incapacitated nearly immediately. Uh, it may take a few uh, seconds or so for the heart to realize that things aren't going well with the brain. Uh, but in terms of uh, capabilities, uh, the person would pretty much drop uh, almost instantly. Okay. And... Um, the, you mentioned that there's some evidence of soot, so there's some indication that it's at closer range? That's correct. Now um, I'd like to move on to the autopsy of um, Michael Miller. I'm going to put on the overhead states 260. Um, Dr. Gavin, is that that same sort of identification photo um, for how his uh, body presented at autopsy? Uh, that's correct. Uh, this is, again, a picture of the body bag in the background, which is black. And then uh, you can't quite see the eyelets as well, but it's the same uh, process where the uh, tag that is blue in this case goes through those eyelets on the body bag, demonstrating that it's sealed in place uh, as it arrives into the forensic office. And then likewise, there is what would become the toe tag there, and uh, both those uh, are also represented in the gray placard is the uh, case number. Okay, and that's 083899? Correct. Okay. Next, I'm going to put uh, 261. Is that that same similar like identification photo that you spoke of earlier? Yes, this is a photo that was taken towards the end of the autopsy process uh, where he's been cleaned up and then we just have the identification card for the case and then a picture of his face. Now, Mr. Miller um, had um, several gunshot wound injuries, is that fair? That's correct. Um, and they're detailed and they're labeled gunshot wound one, two, three, four, five? Correct. Um, the numbering system, does that have any correlation to um, the actual sequence uh, of how the wounds were inflicted? No. Uh, in general, most forensic pathologists tend to go from the top to the bottom. 
um, and so they may number them that way. Uh, I don't know exactly that if that was Dr. Benjamin's style, but that's definitely what I tried to do is go from top to bottom. Okay, so when we talk about gunshot wound injury number one, we're just identifying a particular injury. We're not saying that's where he was shot first. Correct. Okay. Let's look at, uh, this is States 262. What are we looking at there? Uh, so this is after he's been cleaned up, and then you uh, can see uh, two gunshot wounds on his head. Uh, one of them is here, just in front of the left ear, and then another one is uh, just to the lateral aspect, uh, upper lateral aspect of the left eyebrow. Okay, and the one um, uh, closer to his ear um, has been identified within the reports and all those things as gunshot wound one? Correct. Um, I'll put on the overhead states 263. Oh, can you? Oh, yes. Sorry. <laughs> okay. So is that a closer view of gunshot wound one? Yes. And when you look at that, you're able to tell that that is uh, an entrance? Yes. And is what are, you, what are you noting that makes it an entrance? Uh, there is an uh, abrasion collar at the edge of the wound, and abrasion is like a scrape. So as a projectile is entering into the skin surface, it's going to scrape along the skin surface and create an abrasion collar on that area of the skin where it enters. As a projectile exits the body, it's going to tear out of the body and generate what's commonly a laceration, so a tear in the skin as it's exiting. So you may see the abrasion as it's entering and then a laceration as it's exiting. Sometimes on the exit, you will also have an associated contusion in that area because it's kind of uh, slamming into that area, if you will, and then lacerating outward. I'm going to put on the overhead states 264. Is that a closer view of the entrance for um, gunshot wound one? Yes, and if you'll notice, um, we remove the placard when we do these close-up shots because the camera will tend to focus on the placard instead of focusing on the wound itself. But you always see that perspective shot beforehand, which we represented here. So you'll have a perspective shot with our placard with the case number, and then the close-up will be demonstrated uh, shortly thereafter in, in sequence with the uh, wound itself. And then here, this actually gives you a better representation of what I represented as the uh, abrasion area. Uh, in previous uh, description. Okay. Can you clear that? Yep, thank you. This is um, States 265. What are, what are we looking at in that photograph? Uh, we're looking at the top of his head and uh, to the uh, Left upper you know, lateral aspect of the eyebrow is that uh, second uh, entrance uh, gunshot wound. You can't see the one that's near the left ear that we're currently talking about. However, uh, what you can see towards above the right eyebrow and towards the front is uh, what will be the uh, exit gunshot wound that's on the right frontal scalp area. And the quality of this, again, is that laceration quality that I described as an, a part of an exit wound's uh, features. This is states two two sixty six. Should I put it that way, or I think that's better for orientation. Okay, than the and and that is the this is a closer view of that exit. Yes. Uh, so the uh, photographer originally took the picture from the other direction, but this is now just the flipped around, and this is that same wound, and it's the exit gunshot wound. And looking at this, how are you able to tell that it's an exit wound injury? Uh, it has uh, that laceration, and it's without that abrasion. And in addition, it, it doesn't project as well in this particular picture, uh, but it does on the actual photograph there, where you have a little bit of contusion around it as well. I'm going to put on the overhead 267. Yeah, I guess it would be this way, right? Mm -hmm. That's a closer view? Correct. And then, again, that's the laceration for the exit wound. Uh, again, the placard has been removed for the close-up shot. 
Okay. So when we're, this is all what we've been dis discussing is um, gunshot wound one, the one that entered around, uh, well, actually, I should say left ear. Yes, that's correct. I'm going to put on the overhead states 268. And what is, what is that? Uh, during the course of the uh, autopsy procedure, we'll sometimes use probes to demonstrate trajectory through the body. Again, the body in the anatomical position. Uh, we don't know where the head was moving or how it was moving in the dynamicness of the situation, uh, but relative to the anatomical position of the body, uh, this helps demonstrate the trajectory of this particular wound, which is going from left to right, and uh, it's somewhat... Um, upward in terms of the trajectory on, on this one, but that's looking at the body anatomically uh, at, as it lays there. Okay, so looking at this exhibit, the, um, the entrance is, this is the entrance on the left, sort of near the left ear as we saw earlier? That's correct. And then it traveled, and then this is the exit that's sort of the right upper forehead? Correct. Okay. So uh, I would assume then you would agree that this um, injury or this projectile traveled left to right? That's correct. Any um, deviation on front to back or? It's uh, in an upward uh, trajectory as it's coming from this kind of right ear location and heading up towards the body. There is a minimal amount of deviation in, in the front to back direction, but it's uh, small. It's predominantly uh, left to right in an upwards kind of angle. Okay, and what, where did this travel in his head? Like what, what dra damage did it do? So this enters in on the left side and ends up entering into the left uh, parietal area and hits into portions of the left parietal bone and the left frontal bone and then also, excuse me, uh, left frontal lobe and the right frontal lobe and then exits out that right front area. And um, would this wound be independently fatal? Uh, yes, that's go right through goes right through the brain matter. Okay, and any um, well, if someone suffered this type of injury, would it you know cause them to drop to the ground, or what? What do you think would happen to them? Uh, some people can um, go longer seconds with these types of injuries because it's mostly across those frontal lobes, but they're going to be pretty well incapacitated, um, uh, unlike the previous one that we discussed that kind of goes through the middle portion of the brain. I'm going to put back on the overhead states 262, just for orientation purposes. Um, I think earlier in your testimony you said there's another gunshot wound of, of entrance on this photograph? Correct. And can you just um, orient the jurors a little bit, please? Uh, the second gun w gunshot wound about which uh, we're speaking is the one that's on the lateral aspect uh, of the left eyebrow just above it. Okay, and again, we're not suggesting sequence, we're just going um, in order that the wounds were labeled. Correct. Okay, so this is another um, entrance wound on the left-hand side, but uh, higher up on his head. Correct. I'm putting on the overhead states 269. Is that a closer view of that? Um, Entrance wound? Yes. And this also has the abrasion uh, collar uh, that you can see at the edge of the wound uh, as an entrance gunshot wound feature. Okay. This one that was at the, uh, I should do it on the right, on the left side, um, on the left forehead, where did it travel? Uh, this wound actually ends up, or this gunshot path ends up going from that front area uh, through a portion of the frontal bone, through uh, the back portion of the left orbit, and then goes through the maxilla, ends up going through into the, uh, so your maxilla is the upper part, your roof of your mouth, then goes through that and goes and lacerates the tongue, and then comes out through the anterior aspect of the uh, muscle and soft tissues of the neck and then exits there. Okay, so it enters on the left side of his um, forehead essentially? Yes. And then exits on sort of the right side at, at his neck? Yes. So a really steep angle? Correct. I'm putting on the overhead um, states 270.
What is depicted in that photograph? You can see this is uh, his chin is sort of in the, as you're looking at the photo, the upper right corner of this particular photograph. And then you can see sort of where the clavicles are coming together. You could see more of his right clavicle towards the right lower portion of this photo. So you're kind of in that anterior aspect of the neck and more towards the right side of the neck as well. And uh, here you have an exit gunshot wound. Again, that's a laceration that's present. Uh, can you shift the photograph up just a little sure. bit, please? Oh, I don't... Oh, I'm sorry. My apologies. That's okay. Sorry about that. Is that better? Yes, please. So here is the uh, exit wound that's towards the right anterior aspect of his neck. And then uh, you can look down uh, just below his clavicle here, and there is a contusion, a bruise in that area. Uh, in my opinion, that the projectile came downward and then exited and then hit right into that area on the chest. Okay. And then that was the one that, this is two that starts on the, the uh, left forehead and comes out his neck, and then you're saying it probably hit his chest? Yes. Um, you mentioned that it, it kind of goes, you said maxilla, I would assume that means his mouth? Or? Yes, the okay. roof of the mouth. And it lacerates the tongue? Correct. So it's kind of like really in the front part of his face or head? Uh, yes, towards the front portion of his head. Okay. Would, would this injury be immediately incapacitating? Uh, it's unlikely that this injury alone would be immediately incapacitating other than the blood that would be present in the mouth and then he may have some concussive injury from uh, the uh, impact to the head portion. Okay. So let's start, let's talk about um, gunshot wound three. I'm going to put on the overhead states 273. Does that depict it? Is that yes? That's good, yes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. My apologies, mm -hmm. yes. Uh, what are, can you kind of orient the jury on, um, I assume his head would be at the, the top of the, like, top of the image? Correct. At the top of the image would be his head. You can actually see the nipples for an orientation, and towards the lower portion of the photograph, you could see his umbilicus, his belly button, uh, to help you orient where you are on the torso, uh, the portion of the torso. So towards the left upper quadrant of the abdomen is an entrance gunshot wound, uh, which is located here. Okay. And where, um, where does that one travel? Uh, that one uh, travels uh, somewhat uh, superficially through the body and that it uh, goes uh, into the cavity and then uh, goes along the surface uh, underneath the sternum and goes across the pericardial sac and across the heart and then ends up exiting above that. Uh, it didn't curve, I'm sorry, I moved the wands that way. I'll put on the overhead states 272. Oops. Oh, my apologies. Ooh, I, was like, I think I did it too fast. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Does that show the exit of gunshot wound three? Yes. And can you point that out to the members of the jury? Uh, in this case, you'll have the right nipple for orientation, similar to what you saw in the previous photograph. And then uh, just uh, a little bit. Uh, to the center of the chest is where the exit gunshot wound is. Uh, above that to the right near where that collarbone is was that other contusion that I showed you from that previous uh, wound path that we had seen. Uh, but the exit for this one that starts in the left upper quadrant of the abdomen, and I said goes underneath the sternum, goes across the heart, will exit in this area towards the center chest. So this particular injury, three, started in his like l left abdomen lower part? Yes. And then went up, right? Correct. So this goes from uh, left to right and uh, mostly upward without much deviation front or back. Okay. And would this injury, I think you described um, it uh, causing damage to his heart? 
Yes. Um, would this injury be independently fatal? Yes, this injury can be fatal. Although the, I've seen people where they've been uh, shot in their heart and they uh, are able to move afterwards uh, for some period of time and then will collapse. Was there any um, soot or stippling or anything like that associated with this injury? Uh, none identified in the photographs or documented in the report. Okay. Um, I think we'll move to gunshot wound four, and I'm going to put on the overhead states 277. Do you want me to, is it that way? Uh, either is fine. Okay. Um, what are what are we looking at in that photograph? Uh, this is the left side of his body. Uh, you can see on the right aspect of this photograph where you have his axilla and his, his, his left armpit area. And then on the left uh, lateral aspect of his chest, there is an entrance gunshot wound. And you can see that uh, here. Okay. Now, on this particular injury, is there an associated exit wound? No. Where does this projectile travel in his body? Uh, this projectile goes from left to right uh, across his body, and it's a kind of minimal deviation. It goes through his uh, stomach and also goes through a portion of his uh, liver and then kind of goes into his what we call the retroperitoneum, which is the Back, por back portion of uh, soft tissues within the body, so inside the body cavity, and then comes to rest sort of in the back muscles. So there's a little bit of that kind of uh, front to back, uh, but it's minimal within that body space area. What about any deviation of upward or downward in relation to anatomical position? Uh, anatomically, this was a little downward. Okay, so sort of starting on, well, on the left armpit area and then maybe slightly downward? Correct. And then that uh, projectile would have been recovered um, at autopsy? Correct. I'm putting on the overhead states 279. What is that? Uh, this is the projectile recovered from that uh, wound path. Okay. So. Of, we're on the, um, the fourth gunshot wound. All of them have had exits except for this one. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, and this was the projectile recovered from the, the one that starts in sort of like underneath his armpit? Uh, yes, on the left lateral aspect of his chest. Okay. Um, and this one, um, you said it lacerated the liver and stomach? Correct. And so would it be independently fatal? Uh, it will be. Uh, they may uh, live, a bit, live a little bit longer uh, with this particular wound uh, in isolation. Lastly, um, I'm going to talk about gunshot wound five. Um, this is states 280. Well, we can see four still in this image. Is that correct? Yes. And then there's another gunshot wound depicted as well? Yes. And can you um, point that out to the members of the jury, please? Uh, there is a gunshot wound near the uh, left elbow. That's an entrance gunshot wound. And you can see this is uh, somewhat near to where that uh, gunshot wound was of the left lateral aspect of the chest, which and, is down here. And this, this one, so this one sort of enters um, at the back of his arm near the el elbow. Is that fair? Yes, um, and remember when we mentioned the anatomical position is like the person standing with their feet flat and their arms at the side of their bodies with their palms facing forward. So in that case, that this elbow would be con considered in the back of the body. So it would be a uh, backwards area as in terms of anatomical description. And was there an exit wound associated with this injury? Yes. I'm going to put on the overhead states 282. Can you point out the exit wound? Yes, yeah, so now this is his forearm kind of flipped uh, forward uh, more towards the anatomical position about which we've been speaking. And then on that uh, left forearm area is a uh, laceration exit gunshot wound. Uh, this actually does have a little bit of abrasion associated with it and some people would describe these this as a shored exit wound. Uh, as a shored exit wound means that it has qualities of laceration as well as abrasion. 
Uh, the reason you see that combination is if that exit wound area is pressed up against a surface, so as the bullet projectile is trying to get out of the body, it is going to tear out of the body, but it's also going to have the skin surface get scraped against whatever area that is. So it may be that this area of the body was up against the uh, torso surface, so it may be that the arm was against the torso, and that's why you see this different kind of quality to this particular exit wound. Now, it, would this injury have caused like a fracture to the bones in his arm? Yes, you can see uh, the forearm looks a little odd in terms of the way that it's laying there. So there's a fracture at the distal portion of the left humerus, which is your upper arm bone, and also a fracture to the proximal ulna, which is one of the bones that's in your forearm. And again, no soot or stippling associated with it? Correct, none. And um, given the nature of this injury, um, I, I wouldn't think it would be fatal, but... What is your assessment? Uh, this injury on its own is less likely to be fatal because you have mostly fractured uh, bones. Uh, however, you know, you can have other things that can result uh, from wounds like infections and things like that too. Now, um, in terms of um, all of the gunshot wounds, were um, all of the entrances um, on the left side of the body? Yes. And there was only one with a projectile inside the body remaining? Correct. And that was gunshot wound three? Uh, correct. I'm, may I approach her? No, I believe that was gunshot wound four because- Oh, sorry. Nine, I my apologies. Number three is the one that's in the left upper quadrant and it goes upwards and then exits out the center of the chest. And number four is that left lateral one. So it's number four. Okay, and I misspoke. I apologize. Thanks for correcting me. Um, Dr. Gavin, I'm showing you what's been marked as um, states Proposed 289. Do you recognize this image? Yes. Um, is that an image that Mr. Hamner and I showed you um, a couple of weeks before trial? Yes. And when we uh, met with we, you, did we ask you if those um, arrows uh, accurately depicted the directionality of the gunshot wound injuries on Mr. Miller? Yes. And did we ask you if they accurately uh, portrayed the um, location of the injuries. Yes. And in fact, did you have us make a correction um, on one version of this because it wasn't accurate enough in your opinion? Yes. Um, now as it presents in the courtroom today, is it an accurate depiction of the injuries, trajectory, directionality, and location um, from what you reviewed of the autopsy of Mr. Miller? Uh, the only thing I might change is where that contusion and exit is on the upper right anter anterior aspect of the chest. Okay. Uh, this wound that's in the left upper quadrant um, comes more medial to where that contusion is on the anterior aspect of the chest. Okay. Can you do that with the alternate with my pen or can you kind of write the directionality that you've changed? Other than where with that alteration, um, is it a fair and accurate depiction of the location of his injuries, the trajectory, and um, how, he, how he presented in, at autopsy? Yes. State moves to admit t uh, 
addition of Exhibit 289. So, Dr. Gavin, um, looking at 289, there are five arrows. Is that fair? Yes. Can you, with my pen, indicate um, which one is gunshot wound one, two, three, four, and five? Yes. Uh, with the Roman numerals? Or, or just regular numbers. Okay. <laughs> Dr. is in sequence. The first gunshot wound is enters around his left ear and goes out the right forehead? Yes. The second one you describe enters the left forehead and goes um, out his neck? Correct. On the, tending to the right side? Correct. So those are sort of opposite exit points? Yes. Like one's up and one's down? Yes. Okay. And then gunshot wound three starts on the left abdomen and comes out the right side of his chest? Uh, towards More towards the center of the chest. More towards the center. And then gunshot wound four starts on the, the left kind of underneath his armpit? Yes. And that's the one that doesn't exit? Correct. And then gunshot wound five is the one that enters... Um, at the back, or what I would call the back of his uh, left elbow? Yes. Okay. So they're going in varying directions? Uh, yes. S the state um, would uh, move to admit 289. Okay. Now, in association with um, the autopsy of Mr. Miller, um, was toxicology, toxicology done on him as well? Yes. And what were the findings? He had benzylecanine in his system, which is a cocaine metabolite. And from the toxicology reading, are you able, um, as a forensic pathologist, to give us some time frame of when that cocaine might have been ingested? Uh, no, I don't know when he ingested that. Okay. Um, does... Does the finding indicate that it's active or? Uh, that's an inactive metabolite of cocaine. And so does, does that mean, um, I would assume that it, like he didn't just ingest it prior to death. Is that fair? That's fair. Okay. Um, is there any kind of time frame on that metabolite? I mean, could it be like I, he ingested an hour before or is that something you can't estimate from the toxicology? Uh, in general, it can be uh, hours for them to metabolize it by a certain half lives but uh, I don't know what his rate of metabolism would be, and I don't know what his usage would be. Okay, but it's only the metabolite that's present in the blood? Correct. Okay, so when you um, say you ingested cocaine and then immediately were shot, would, it, would you see the metabolite or would you see, like, active cocaine? Uh, people, after they've died, don't do not continue to metabolize drugs. Um, so you, you're looking at more of a representation of what he has uh, in his system at the time or close to the time of his death. And so his is, though, the metabolite? Yes. Do you have, um, did you reach a conclusion regarding the cause of death of Mr. Miller? Yes. And what is that? Multiple gunshot wounds. And did you reach a conclusion um, regarding the manner of death? Yes. And what is that? Homicide. Thank you. I will pass the witness, Your Honor. Good afternoon, Doctor. Good afternoon. Um, you didn't perform any of the functions of the autopsy for either Sharon Randolph or Mike Miller, right? That, that's correct. In fact, you had access under those file numbers that we saw in the photographs. 
unique to that individual autopsy, so you can go back and lead, read the report that was prepared at the time of autopsy, yes? Yes. And you did that in this case? Yes. And those autopsies were performed by Dr. Benjamins? Correct. Okay. Corresponding with those reports are also the photographs that you mentioned? Correct. And you feel that you had an opportunity to review sufficiently the notes that were taken, the autopsy report, the file in its totality, including photographs that you can render the opinions you just did? Yes. Okay. So I just want to talk to you about a couple things you said on direct examination. You said one of the things that happens in a case of a suspicious death is the way the body bag is sealed up. Remember that? Yes. When you say suspicious death, almost every gunshot wound is going to qualify, right? Correct. As opposed to natural causes, I'm 100 years old and I die in my sleep. Correct. So anytime someone is shot and killed in a violent act, that bag would be sealed up. Yes. And the reason you do that is because it's imperative that you review the body in, as best possible in the shape it is at the time it's located. Correct. For forensic reasons, right? Correct. For medical reasons, right? Yes. To be accurate, correct? Yes. For instance, if a body was discovered where someone had been shot and you didn't preserve it, you threw it in the back of a pickup truck and drove around town with it all day, carried it into the coroner's office, autopsy might not be as accurate. Uh, there could possibly be that, yes. <laughs> okay. You don't want to contaminate the work that you're going to do. Agreed? Correct. Okay. Um, you mentioned a couple terms on direct examination, and I just want to make sure that it's clear for the jury. When you talk about the body itself and the injuries that that body sustained, you do it in the traditional anatomic position, right? That's correct. You would agree with me that we as human beings, you as you came in here to testify, and me as I'm asking you questions, and the jurors as they're seated in the box, almost are never in an actual anatomic position. Yes. It is feet flat on the ground, right? Correct. And the palms at the side extended forward. Correct. I mean, I'd look pretty weird if I was standing like that on the street, right? Yeah, and also your face forward, too. Right, so. I'd have to be completely straight, correct? <laughs> correct. Okay. You indicated that you do that so that you can accurately identify both exteriorly and interiorly the wounds, the defects, the medical incidents that cause a death that you're investigating, right? It uh, helps us with where anatomical locations are and then to be able to have a consistent way and to describe those to others. And that's the majority of uh, the reasoning. Also, it helps when you're describing things like trajectories that we've been describing too. Right. In the anatomical position, for instance, as it relates to wound number three on Mr. Miller, you can say left upper quadrant of abdomen, and any pathologist reading that's going to know where it's at. Right. Okay. You also used a term a couple times in direct examination. You said a dynamic situation. Do you remember that? Yes. What did you mean by that? If you have people moving around or any type of altercation that's going on, people are going to be moving. And just as counselor said, that the body isn't going to stay in that exact position during that interaction between those individuals. And you would agree with me as a pathologist, it's almost impossible to tell um, in what position a body was at the time it was shot. Almost, but there are conditions that you can uh, infer what's going on based on what you have for injury. Right. You agree it's almost impossible to tell the position a body is in at the time it's struck by a gunshot. Yes, almost. Um, and you certainly aren't trying to indicate to the ladies and gentlemen of the jury how either Sharon Randolph or Mike Miller were standing or positioned at the time of any one of these gunshot wounds, right? That's correct. Okay. You also indicated that you can't provide any ordering of shots. Do you understand what I mean by that? Yes. When you have a situation, as you did with Mr. Miller's autopsy, the fact that he had five separate gunshot wounds, presumably at or near the time of one another, you can't tell us if any one of those came before or after any of the others. Correct. In Ms. Randolph's case, it's a little bit different because you have one gunshot wound. Correct. All right. I want to talk to you real quickly about the autopsy of Ms. Randolph, Okay. Um, single gunshot wound essentially above and slightly behind her ear. Is that right? Yes. Um, would you describe that as a contact wound? Yes. 
What do you mean by a contact wound? Uh, for her, she has both the radiating lacerations and she has some uh, soot within that wound as well. Uh, so the muzzle is uh, either uh, adjacent to or on the uh, skin surface itself. Okay, so at the time Mike Miller puts the gun to Sharon Randolph's head and pulls the trigger, it's touching her head. Yes. Um, that wound almost always would be immediately incapacitating. Yes. Meaning she would drop instantly, right? Yes. Not be able to stand. Right? Yes. Wouldn't be able to crawl, yell, respond, things like that. Correct. And that wound would almost always be fatal. Yes. With very rare exception, the type of injury she sustained, she cannot survive from. Right. Um, in the external examination of a body at autopsy, when you're going head to toe and looking around the exterior, you identify characteristics that are unique to that person, right? In general, yes. If they have obvious scars, for instance, you would notate that. Yes. And you would notate things like tattoos, correct? Yes. And in fact, in this case, in reviewing the file and the photographs, you were able to notate a number of tattoos on Ms. Randolph's body. Is that right? Um, I don't recall where hers are specifically. Is it in your report? Yes. Do you have a copy of it with you? Yes. We're referring to that report, refresh your recollection about the location and substance of her tattoos. Uh, more likely than not, yes. Okay. If you could take a minute and do that, just so it's clear. Okay. As I look at it's page three of the report authored by Dr. Benjamin, there's an area called identifying marks. Correct. And you've had an opportunity to review that? Yes. Can you tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury what tattoo she had? Objection relevance. She has a what's described as a sunburst uh, tattoo uh, that is located on the lateral left upper arm, and below that uh, is inscribed Colleen, and also inscribed next to it or above to above it is Nicholas. She has a design tattoo on her right forearm um, that's near the wrist. She has a heart tattoo on her right labia majora. She has a tattoo uh, within that that's labeled TR for initials TR. 
And then on her right leg, she also has a central uh, red heart, a centered red heart. And then there is a black design within that heart. And then on the lateral left leg, uh, she also has a black scorpion tattoo with a red stinger. Okay. Um... The significance of those may not mean anything to you, but certainly significant at the time of autopsy to notate those identifying characteristics. Yes. Okay. And that's done in every autopsy. Uh, some doctors do, and some doctors just say refer to the photographs. Okay. Dr. Benjamin always does, right? Uh, she, I don't know if she always does, but she did there. <laughs> okay. Um, Sharon had nothing in her system in the way of illicit substances, she wasn't drugged, she wasn't under the influence of alcohol at the time of her death, she had a clean tox, right? Correct. Okay. I want to talk to you then about Mr. Miller's autopsy. Um, the state asked you a bunch of questions about the directionality of the separate listed gunshot wounds that were sustained by Mr. Miller. Yes. You would agree with me, as you said before, that you can't tell us whether one came before another, right? Correct. And you can't tell us without knowing a lot more information about how those wounds were inflicted, right? How? What do you mean by how? For instance, um, the state asked you there was an entrance wound. It's referred to um, as gunshot wound number two in the report on the left side of the forehead. Do you remember that? Yes. And that had an exit wound at the right anterior neck, correct? Yes. Anterior meaning front? Yes. Um, the question was asked by Ms. Weckerly, that's a very steep angle, right? Yes. Without knowing where and in what position the gun was fired and in where and what position Mr. Miller was, you can't tell us how that gunshot wound happened, right? In terms of the steep angle, per se? Right. Uh, Correct. I was interpreting steep, deep angle based on the anatomical position of the body. Right. And I'm just going to give you a couple maybe silly examples. If I'm standing here and someone's standing directly above me on the second floor and there's an opening, they could shoot directly down on top of my head and make that wound, right? Yes. Likewise, if you were shooting me and I was bent over at the waist, that could cause the same wound, right? Yes. Also, the position of the person pulling the trigger would be relevant, too, right? Correct. You'd have to know that information in order to say how those wounds were inflicted. Correct. And there's nothing about your review of Dr. Benjamin's autopsy, the photograph, or the report, which would give you the ability to do that, right? The ability to know where each individual is positioned right. during the interaction. No, that's correct. And it would be pure speculation for you to try to do that? Yes. Okay. Um, are you familiar with the terms perforating and penetrating gunshot yes. wounds? Can you describe for the ladies and gentlemen of the jury what those terms mean? Uh, penetrating gunshot wound is a gunshot wound that's entered into the body and generally you're recovering something in there that's penetrated into the body versus a perforating gunshot wound that's gone through and through the body. Okay, so when we talk about the separate gunshot wounds as they relate to Mr. Miller, you've got four separate perforating wounds, right? Correct. Wounds with an entrance and an exit, correct? Correct. And you've got a singular penetrating wound, right? Correct. That's a wound with an entrance and no exit. Correct. As it relates to Miss Randolph, what type of wound did she have? Uh, she essentially has a penetrating gunshot wound. Meaning that there's an entrance wound, right? Correct. And in fact, there was the projectile and then a fragment from that projectile recovered at the time of autopsy. Yes. The state elicited at the end of direct examination the results of the toxicology test of Mr. Miller. Do you remember that? Yes. You would agree with me that if someone ingests cocaine, over time it breaks down into a metabolite, right? Correct. How quickly that breakdown happens is dependent on a number of factors within that person and the thing that they're ingesting, right? Yes. 
You can't tell us as a result of that toxicology report whether Mr. Miller had ingested a whole lot of cocaine that morning, right? Correct. Or a little bit not too long before the incident. Right? Correct. Um, what you can tell us as, it, as a result of the toxicology that's done is that he had ingested cocaine, right? Correct. And it was in his system in some form at the time of his death. Correct. Um, you also don't have any information about how the ingestion of cocaine would affect him, right? True. Would affect his decision making, correct? Correct. His motor skills. Correct. Um, the way he would behave under its influence. Uh, we do have some references to these things in terms of what these drugs do to people, but I don't know how he's behaving relative to that. Precisely my point. Yeah. You can tell us, as you said before, he had ingested it. It's breaking down in the system, but you don't know at the time of his death what the influence on him may be. That's correct. At the time of autopsy, are individuals weighed and measured? Yes. And were both of these individuals weighed and measured? Yes. Could you tell us the height and weight of both Ms. Randolph and Mr. Miller? Uh, Ms. Randolph is about 194 pounds and about 70 inches in length. And then Mr. Miller is about 134 pounds and roughly about 70 inches in length. Courts and buildings. In terms of feet and inches, how tall is 70 inches? Uh, it's not quite six feet. Uh, but we also measure the length of the body, and so when the body's laying flat, um, it won't exactly be what might be on your driver's license per se, uh, because we're, you're more relaxed in those positions, so it tends to be a little bit longer than what would be, say, on your driver's license. Okay. So Mr. Tomchak asked you about the cocaine uh, metabolite in Mr. Miller's uh, toxicology report. Um, was it, was there any active cocaine in his tox? No. So it was all metabolite? Yeah, it was a benzalacanine. Okay. Um, why at autopsy um, is trajectory noted or memorialized? Uh, it's to help with where, if you're able to kind of reconstruct the scene, where the individuals might be relative to the gun and the uh, target, target being the individual that's struck. Uh, so it's one of the ways in which you can talk about the body again in the anatomical position and see relative to perhaps even scene reconstruction where those weapons might be within that environment. It's to assist in some of that aspect, but it's also to try to look at the areas of injury within the body itself. Okay. And so for a forensic pathologist, sort of your lane in this investigation is this is how trajectory presented at autopsy given the anatomical position. That's correct. Um, and how that may or may not fit in with the crime scene is sort of left to someone else. You are just looking at it anatomical position at autopsy. That's correct. But it is information and data that's collected because it could be relevant um, in a particular case? Correct. Now, um, Mr. Tomchak spent some time talking about um, tattoos on um, Mrs. Randolph, um, and I think you said that some doctors don't even note what the tattoos are. They just say, like, see the photographs, correct? Correct. It, tattoos could be relevant in um, identifying an individual that um, maybe had no, like, personal identification on them. Like, say you came upon someone, um, you know, who didn't have any personal effects or any means of identification. Yes, many people now are identified either through someone visualizing that body and saying that is so-and-so, whoever that individual is. Uh, then you can also look at uh, fingerprint identification. You can also look at radiograph comparison. You can look at dental comparison if you have a dentist that they had in life to demonstrate uh, similarities in that. And then, of course, you can get into DNA. So we have a lot of kind of modern ways in which to do that. 
uh, tattoos in terms of representation. They're uh, identifiers for individuals, but they may not be the sole reason in which, in which we identify that particular decedent. Uh, we tend to go for more of the scientific ways of doing it, uh, particularly because people may have um, the same tattoo or a similar tattoo or something like that. Uh, tattoos can be very useful when you end up with body parts or situations where you have body parts and those parts have a tattoo. So that may help you in terms of trying to figure out who that uh, body part may belong to and they can become very useful for that. So they're not always something that uh, is used definitively as a scientific way in which to identify an individual. And in, in this case, with regard to um, Mrs. Randolph's tattoos, um, do they have any medical significance? Uh, in, in my opinion, they're just uh, markings or for that individual, uh, not relevant to her identification in this case. Okay. And they certainly don't relate to her cause of death? Uh, correct. Don't relate to her manner of death? Uh, correct. Um, and I, would they be re reflective of her state of mind, or could you even make that type of conclusion? Uh, that would be speculative. Okay. Um, we don't know when she got the tattoos. I, I don't know. There's no way of medically determining that as she presented at autopsy? Uh, correct. Um, lastly, the, um, the bullet that was recovered at autopsy with um, Mrs. Randolph, that wasn't an intact bullet, right? It was fragmented? That's correct. It was fragmented itself and also fragmented from the jacket. Okay. Thank you. And we will keep Dr. Galvin subject to recall, Your Honor, from the jury's perspective. Just real quick, um, the state asked you some questions about um, trajectory and why that may be important in an investigation. Do you remember that question? Yes. Um, it may be that the trajectory could be relevant to some other part of an investigation that has nothing to do with the autopsy, right? That's correct. Your job at autopsy is to document as completely as possible all of the information available. Right? Yes. And for instance, a gunshot wound like number five, the one to Mr. Miller's elbow, you can tell us there's a wound to the elbow and this is the direction it traveled, right? Anatomically, the direction it traveled. Right. You can't tell us from an injury like that whether the person was shot from in front or behind, however, right? Yes, because you don't know where that arm is relative to the time and the space in their environment. Because the arm of a person can move a lot in a dynamic situation. Yes. And in a case where there's a number of wounds, like Mr. Miller sustained, that aren't immediately incapacitating, that arm could move all over the place, right? It's possible that it's mobile, if you will. So he could have been shot in that elbow from behind, right? Possible. He could have been shot with his elbow in front, right? Possible. He could have been shot turned to the right in that elbow, right? Uh, correct. And in my opinion, it's probably closer to the body based on the exit wound. Right. And he could have been turned to the left with his arm close to the body as well, right? Yes. You can't tell us anything about that other than what you previously testified to. Right? Correct. Okay. Likewise, tattoos could be relevant to some other part of an investigation that you just don't know about, right? I Possibly. Yeah. You wouldn't know that, right? Uh, no, not unless it's been informed to me. Right. As a medical examiner forensic pathologist, someone conducting an autopsy, you would document the medically important things, right? Correct. And there may very well be something on that body that's relevant somewhere else that you just don't know. It, yeah, it depends on what you're talking about, the medical legal death investigation portion of it. Uh, so it's just beyond some of that medical only, and there's that medical legal, and you need that investigation piece to be able to put those pieces together. Precisely my point. You would agree with that, right? Yes. No follow-up. Do the ladies and gentlemen of the jury have any questions for this witness? Do you write a
receive them or their actual time of death? Uh, when our uh, investigators go to the scene, they are able to pronounce death. And so when they view the bodies, they will pronounce death. And that tends to be the date and time that they put into that area. Um, so they are allowed to pronounce death and say like a clinician at the hospital will be able to pronounce death. So even though other medical personnel may be there, it's just the coroner investigator that's allowed to pronounce. Was there any soot found on the number one and number two entrance wounds? I assume from the mail um, for that one. Uh, yeah, I, assuming it's from the mail, uh, uh, since he has more than one shot, um, there is none. Okay, state your follow-up based on your report. Yes, if um, the coroner uh, investigator finds a decomposed body, the uh, date and time of death will be the time they found it, right? That's correct. So it doesn't actually relate like this is the exact time of death. It, it's just when the investigator pronounces death. That's correct. So it could be a skeleton in the desert and they'll pronounce at the time that they identify the body. Thank you. Yeah, just as it relates to that issue, when someone is found following, for instance, a 911 call and a shooting, the coroner investigator responds to that location, right? Correct. And at that location, there are law enforcement personnel there, right? Correct. The coroner, the coroner investigator physically goes into the scene to pronounce death, right? Right, when it's cleared. Understood. Yeah. Thank you, nothing but that. Do the ladies and the jury have any further questions for this witness? Okay, seeing so you no know response, Dr. Debbie, you are excused. Thank you very much for your testimony here today.
be seated. The jury's all present at that time. We are back on the record. C-250-966, David Bell versus Thomas Burlock. We're the record for Mr. Randolph as president of the attorney. Yes, we just chose on behalf of the state. We both parties stated that you're the presence of our jury. Yes, Your Honor. Yes, sir. State, you may call your next witness. Thank you, Your Honor. The state calls Randy McPhail. Yes. Yes. Uh, first name is Randall. It's R A N D A L L. Last name is McPhail. M C capital P H A I L. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, sir, how were you employed back in 2008? I was a uh, senior crime scene analyst with the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department. And have you since retired? Yes. And what year did you retire? 2018. What was the process um, uh, for you in becoming a crime scene analyst? Did you start off in a certain position and then move up? Yeah, well, first of all, you have to have the qualifications to even test for the crime scene analyst. I had over 30 years' experience in photography. Um, I also completed university courses in uh, mathematics and, and uh, chemistry and some business related courses as well. Um, I once tested, once I tested and was hired, I went through the Crime Scene Analyst Academy as a Crime Scene Analyst 1 and also the field training and evaluation program for Crime Scene Analysts. It's a, the CSA 1 job is an entry-level position where you really gain the foundation for your future work as a crime scene analyst, hopefully a senior crime scene analyst. After spending two years as a um, crime scene analyst 1, you're able to test for crime scene analyst 2. And uh, that's a more responsible position, one that uh, handles more person calls versus the property calls that you probably came from as a CSA 1. Um, it's also a preparatory position for the CSA 3. Uh, the CSA 3 or the Senior Crime Scene Analyst, um, that is uh, another testing process. It takes you four years to get to that point where you can test for that position. And um, it's a rigorous testing process. And uh, when you're done with that, um, you're pretty much handling person calls as well as some property calls, but mostly person calls. And that means uh, you might be working on homicides, you might be working on sexual assaults, uh, complex scenes. Um, but it takes you four years to get to that position and quite a bit of testing. And so in, when you work for Metro as a crime scene analyst, your proficiency tested within the organization? Yes. And um, you're evaluated and you either promote or you don't promote, is that Correct. fair? Um, and you have um, training in all aspects of crime scene documentation and preservation? Yes. Um, and that would be photography and then doing measurements, making diagrams, that sort of thing? Yes. Um, do you also, you personally have, um, or at least in 2008, were you, did you have a special, um, I guess, qualification in the area of blood stain pattern analysis? Yes, I uh, completed um, probably about 125 hours worth of training for uh, blood stain pattern an analysis. I also completed uh, approximately 129 hours for shooting incident reconstruction and uh, did quite a bit of work in those two fields during my career. Now, for those, for those designations, were those separate and apart from Metro? Like, is there a... a like an independent body of Metro that um, says you're qualified in the area of blood stain pattern analysis and interpretation? Uh, there is. Uh, we, I did do a lot of work with Metro. We had classes that we try to get uh, everybody on board with blood stain pattern analysis. So we had cl classes for that. Um, if you certify in blood stain pattern analysis, you do so through the International Association for Identification. Um, you also, I, I certified as. Uh, 
in crime scene reconstruction, with, which dealt with blood stain pattern analysis, as well as shooting incident reconstruction. And uh, cold case homicides were part of that uh, class as well. Um, so yeah, there is uh, further education, uh, and the certification goes through the International Association for Identification. And over the, over the course of your career until your retirement, how many crime scenes do you think that um, you've been to? I, uh, sorry to say, I really didn't keep track of it. I'm sure it's, I, I believe it's around the 6,000 mark when I left uh, the, the department. Uh, probably ranging in complexity from simple burglaries all the way up to um, more complex person calls like uh, sexual assaults and homicides. Okay. And um, back in, on May the 15th of 2008, were you requested to go to an address on Rancho Santa Fe Drive um, by homicide detectives? Yes. Uh, and do you recall um, which detective it was that re requested that you come out? Um, I believe it was Dino Kelly who asked okay. him to come out. And so um, do, you, do you recall what the purpose was for you in going out there? Yes. What was that? I had two purposes. The first was uh, when homicide detectives returned to the scene to do a reenactment, they actually found two additional 9mm cartridge cases in the garage that were not found on the night of the 8th when the scene actually happened. Um, so I was called to collect those, document their positions and collect those as well. I was also uh, called to document some um, oily deposits on the walls inside the hallway. And what, why were you um, called to um, document those deposits on the hallway? They would have been associated with the shooting. Uh, there was blood, hair, tissue, uh, all in the hallway at high levels. It went up uh, from 5 feet 8 above the floor all the way up to the ceiling in some places at 12 feet high. And they wanted me to document those so they could be analyzed in the future if they needed to. When you went out there, did you take your own photographs documenting your work? Yes. And did you also uh, prepare diagrams um, sort of representing what you found at the scene? Yes. Your Honor, may I approach the witness? Yes. You. Photographs which um, have been admitted as uh, states 215 to 246. I'll ask you to just look through those yourself and let me know when you're done, please. Okay. photographs look like when the ones that you took uh, on that evening? The only one that question is the first one, and it might have well have been mine. It's just so generic, I'm not sure that I took it. Okay, but does it fairly and accurately represent the location? Yes. Okay, now I'm showing you um, states 247 to 249. Do you recognize these three diagrams? Yes, I do. Are those diagrams that you prepared? Yes. So I think you said your um, first purpose in going uh, back to the scene that evening was to collect some evidence. That's correct. I'm going to put on the overhead uh, states 216. And is your screen on in there? Yes. Okay. Um, so uh, obviously one of your duties as a crime scene analyst is to collect evidence, correct? Yes. The evidence that you were asked to collect that night, um, did you find it yourself or was it pointed out to you by homicide detectives and sergeants? It was indeed pointed out to me by homicide detectives. And what was the nature of the evidence? They were uh, fired 9 millimeter cartridge cases. Now looking at um, 216, what are we looking at in terms of the area of the residence? This would be the southwest corner of the garage where the um, 
water heater is. You can see the water heater by the door. This door here I always refer to as the fire door. It's a thick, solid door that leads from the garage into the interior of the residence. Uh, we see a red toolbox right by the water heater. There's also a tray that's used for tools uh, in front of that toolbox by the water heater. Water softener in front of the water heater. Can you, um, I think there's a mouse up there. Can you circle the, um, the sort of bluish green toolbox? Just for the members of the jury. And is that the location of one of the cases that you recovered? Yes. I'm going to put on the overhead next, dates 217. Um, what are we looking at in that photograph? It's the same area, but it's a different angle. This is actually looking west. So we have the water softener on the right side of the water heater. Uh, the the tray, this uh, blue tray that holds tools and other items inside, uh, that was by the water heater in this area here, and there was a cartridge case in this in this uh, tray. There was also a cartridge case down in this area here that we'll see in a moment, I'm sure. Okay, I'm gonna um, put on the overhead states 219. Do you see the cartridge case in the blue tray? Yes, uh, it's right in the very top section, the blue tray. Uh, by the pliers. And then this is States 220. And this is, uh, the softener is right here. The line that goes up is the side of the water softener. <clears throat> this is a pedestal for the water heater. And right here we can see a cartridge case by that empty uh, water container. So one was in sort of that blue tool tray and one was by that bottle of water next to the water heater? Correct. Um, what did you do with those items after they were pointed out to you? I photographed them, documented them in my notes, and then uh, recovered them. I'm um, putting on the overhead states 221. Does that appear to be one of the items? Yes. And this is states um, 223. Is that the second one? Yes. And then you would have um, impounded those, is that right? That is correct. Um, and then they would have been... Um, submitted for uh, firearms analysis by another person. Correct? Yes, you don't do you don't do that. No, right? I don't. Okay, so the the second reason that you were asked to go out there is because I think you said there were some oily deposits on the wall that the homicide detectives wanted you to look at. Correct. Um, you over the course of your career, um, did you have occasion to attend autopsies? Yes. And um, do you, any estimate on how many that you went to? Um, I, I think it's probably over 100, but I don't know exactly. I didn't, I didn't keep track of those as well, but I, I uh, attended autopsies the first uh, maybe five or six years in my career as a crime scene analyst, and um, there was probably hundreds of them. You described um, the spots earlier as oily deposits. Um, were they consistent with anything that you had observed at autopsy over uh, the course of your career? I, I th thought that it was probably cerebral fluid that surrounds the brain, that it came from some kind of brain uh, injury and uh, kind of painted the walls with these small specks of uh, fluid that leached out into the flat wall paint. Okay, and had you seen that before at prior scenes? Yes. Is that why you thought that was possible in this case? Yes. The consistency of um, cerebral fluid, how would you describe it? Uh, a very light, uh, oily uh, consistency. Now, when you um, went about doing sort of the secondary purpose here, not impounding the um, cartridge cases, but uh, examining the walls, what steps did you go through? I first examined uh, the walls, um, and this would have been the area where uh, Sharon Randolph was killed, around that area. Examined the walls, um, took notes on that, drew some diagrams so I could later make the diagrams that you'll see here today. And uh, then I uh, attached little arrows uh, showing directionality if possible, if not just showing the round stains that weren't so directionally. Sometimes when a stain, when something hits the wall, you can actually tell the direction of it based on the tail that's uh, going from the end of it. The, these were roundish stains about the size of a quarter. There was a lot of them in that area. And some of the stains did have some uh, directionality with uh, small blood stains inside, very small. They were probably about uh, one half millimeter in diameter, really small stains. 
I'm going to put on the overhead um, states 214. Um, when you um, when you got to the residence on the 15th, um, did you walk uh, this hallway from? I know there this you weren't there on the night of the the homicides, but did you walk this hallway on the 15th? Definitely. And um, were you? Uh, looking at the, the walls of the hallway for um, possible evidence. Yes. Um, you said um, that you ended up focusing in the area where uh, Mrs. Randolph's body was? Uh, yes, but also uh, this whole hallway, uh, there were those small stains I was referring to earlier, the oily deposits as well as blood, tissue, hair on this wall here and on these, this wall here, also above the bathroom door. And there was a little overhang. I guess it was probably due to air conditioning or something over the master bedroom door. So above your head, a little overhang. Okay. There was uh, uh, stains on that as well. Okay. And um, when you walked it, did the detectives um, tell you where to look, or did you just do that based on your own experience? I, di I did it myself. Okay. They, they told me that the event happened in the hallway. Obviously, it was a week after I got there. So they just told me the event happened in the hallway, and they pointed out a couple of things, uh, maybe a couple of stains, maybe some hair uh, on the walls. I, I can't remember specifically, but um, I, I examined the area myself. Okay. And I think you said that um, ultimately you, you kind of look at this, this wall uh, here and this wall as well as you examine this wall. Is that fair? Yes. And... Um, you actually look at this wall too, which is by the bathroom. Is that correct? That is correct. Um, so you did sort of a walkthrough. You looked for areas of possible evidence. What would be the next step that you took in investigating um, this scene? Again, I would do the, the notes would follow that. My initial drawings at the scene would follow that. Uh, all the, the little arrows I put up there for directionality would follow that initial uh, process. And um, you said you, you would mark things on the walls that you saw? Yes. Okay. I'm going to put on the overhead states 225. Let me zoom out just a little bit. Um, so kind of orienting, that appears to be if you're standing in the hallway facing the master bedroom? Yes, that's correct. So okay. you're looking south right now. Okay. And when we look at the left of that, uh, this photograph, there appears to be numerous kind of yellow uh, arrow stickers. Correct. Is that your work? That is my work. And what, what are you documenting there that you see? Those would be the uh, oily stains. And again, some of these stains had uh, blood stains within them as well. And I'm going to put on the overhead states 228. Is that just a different view? Yes, this is looking toward the east. So this wall here, we actually saw it in the previous photo, but uh, this is looking east. The doorbell uh, chime is, is right here on that wall. And also of note, there's a possible impact right here, uh, a bullet impact or a bullet fragment impact. Okay. And um, did you uh, measure or do you know how high up that was? None of the stains were below 5 feet 8. They were all above that point, and they went all the way in some cases to the ceiling. So they're, they're approaching the 12 foot mark. Okay, and you actually have your measuring tape here? Yes. I think I have a close up of a stain. Um, this would be states um, 230. Is that sort of a close up of what you were talking about? This is actually a, a, a evidence sample that I collected. It, it, you can see tissue on it, possibly a bit of hair. That was uh, my item number four. At the time. And you would have impounded that? Correct. And that would have been, um, or could have been submitted for DNA testing? Correct. And someone else does that, you collect it, and then someone else tests it? Yes. I want to show a different photograph. This is States 236. Is that a different area that you marked as well? Yes, uh, the number four is still visible here. It'll be the same number. I didn't have two number fours. So that's number four. It's in the area labeled F, like Frank, and it shows uh, numerous um, impact, or little blood impacts, tissue impacts, and uh, that oily substance impact on the door above the bathroom. 
And next I'm going to put on the overhead states 241. And just for orientation purposes, this is the door to the garage. Yes. So like from the house going out to the garage. Correct. And I see some markings up here on the ceiling. Is that fair? Yes. And what, what were you marking up there? There's blood and tissue up on the air conditioning um, cover, the air vent cover. Um, there's also hair and a fatty substance uh, up there. And uh, you can see labels here, two and one. Those are my evidence labels. So that's one and two item that I picked up from the scene, samples from that area. I'm going to put on the overhead states 242. I guess that one. Well, can you see um, the, the item of evidence there that you're pointing at is like a, a hair and a little bit of tissue? That's correct, right there. And that would be on the, um, the metal portion of that air vent intake. And, and this is states um, 243. Little fatty <coughs> deposit right here again on that. Uh, it's it's metal. It's highly gloss paint. Yes. And so, ultimately, after you do all these markings and um, measurements, you prepare um, diagrams to represent uh, what you found. Um, correct. Um, I saw a photo in there that you had just put away. It <coughs> shows a, the oily stains are extremely difficult to photograph. And um, this photo right here shows about what we're looking at with them. Uh, if I used a flash on them as we typically do inside, it completely drowned those uh, oily stains away. And this is kind of what we were looking at um, when we just come here. You can see little uh, round stains here. There, there's a few of them, but they're extremely difficult to photograph. They only showed up on these um, ambient light shots where you use the light inside the house that's there already to show it. And, <coughs> excuse me, for the record, this is States 244. So what you're pointing out are sort of these shinier um, circular shaped yes. things. Is yes. that fair? It okay. Um, and so that's what you were analyzing in order to try to determine like a placement of when a shot was inflicted, is that Correct. Right? Um, part of that was doing um, diagrams of uh, the evidence that you located? Yes. So let's see, I will start with this is State's Exhibit 248. And to orient us, just for one second, I'm going to put side by side um, 214, which is the crime scene diagram. Okay. If you flipped it over um, there, that would be more appropriate. Okay, perfect. So we have um, 214 on the right, and then 248 is on the left. And so the vantage point here is looking towards the master bedroom. Is that right? That's correct. And the ba master bedroom is right here. That The doorway to the master bedroom is right here. This would be the door to the master bedroom. Okay. And so you have a mark on 248, or your diagram on 248 has areas marked D, E, and F. Is that correct? Yes. And so that's where you were noting... Um, the oily deposits that uh, you that you were speaking of earlier in your testimony. Yes, these uh, of course they weren't laid out in square. It's it that was just my area for them. Uh, they they would have been a different pattern altogether. I just wanted to measure in how big these areas were and put them on the wall. So D would be the east wall of the north south hallway. E is that little overhang over the master master bedroom entry area. And F would be the wall just above the bathroom door. Uh, the south wall of the east-west um, hallway is right here. Now, on the, on the south wall, um, did you find any um, tissue or blood or oily deposits or anything like that that, um, that you noticed when you were there on the 15th? No, there was absolutely nothing on that wall. And that kind of helped to decide, help me decide where that shooting took place. Okay. Um, and so I think you said, like, obviously they weren't deposited in perfect squares or like Correct. a rectangle in a square, but they were generally in these areas of D, E, and F. Correct. And so that's what you're representing in uh, 
248. Yes. Now, I'm going to put, um, well, actually, sorry, if I could just go back one second to um, 248. You made measurements um, on these of how high up they were. Is that correct? Yes. And what, what is the measurement? Um, they would actually be in one of the diagrams. I'm not sure which one, but I, I actually have all of those measured. Okay, let me let me zoom in here. Um, you measured, like for instance, on these diagrams, you would measure where the overhang was, and it would be nine three. That's like, correct. Nine feet three yes. inches or eight feet six inches. That like, type of thing. Yeah, that like section D or uh, sorry, uh, area E went uh, nine foot three. If I'm reading it right, yeah. nine foot three high, and uh, it was as low as eight foot six above that. That overhang. Okay, and you did the same thing for F as well. You measured, um, you measured in as high as nine feet or seven feet three inches. Yes. So let me now put um, on side by side uh, states two forty seven. Okay. So this you have uh, labeled. Um, as the east wall. Correct. And looking at the, the other diagram, can you kind of point out where this is? Yes, this would be uh, the east wall right here. Okay. And there's the, the door jam that you can kind of see. Area D is right against this door jam here, and that door is right here. So this door corresponds to this door? Correct. Okay. And so you looked at this east wall for those same um, oily deposits or uh, evidence of uh, gunshot wounds or some high velocity injury. Yes. Um, and you also, with area D, measured in um, how high up they were? Yes. And I think that's uh, as low as five, point, 5 feet 9 inches? Right. And then it looks like you also labeled on your diagram here item 4, hair and tissue. Correct. And that was 8 feet 3 inches up? Yes. Uh, and then some of the deposits went as high up as nine feet six inches? Yes. And again, that's along this wall right, right here. That is correct. Lastly, I'd like to put on the overhead states um, 249. Now looking at our, our diagram of the house, where, where is this wall? That is right here. It's uh, this would be the east-west hallway. And that is the north wall of the east-west hallway. Okay. So on, you're not talking about this wall right here. You're talking about this side of it, correct? That is correct. Okay. And in terms of what you saw on this wall, you also saw some of those um, same deposits, and then I think you took a blood sample, and you have that as item three. That's correct. And then. Um, you measured out other um, other items of evidence that you found? Yes, I showed uh, where other uh, small blood drops were here, here, and in the section called A right here. Uh, also, a continuation would be up to the uh, air conditioning vent as well. And it looks like at the air conditioning vent, you, col you collected another item of evidence that uh, was yellow fatty tissue. Right. We looked at those photos earlier. One was a, a head hair, I believe, and the other was a fatty tissue from the air conditioning vents here and here. Okay. And so you um, were able to make observations of this scene as to all of those walls and, and look at the evidence, themse the evidence itself. First, in terms of like what you observed on the wall, um, was it consistent with um, like a high velocity injury like a gunshot wound? Yes. And um, when you were going there on the 15th, um, was part of the question for homicide detectives um, about like where uh, Sharon Randolph might have been when she was shot? Yes. And what, what determination did you make based on what you saw? I would have uh, put her shooting right near the bathroom, um, not too far from that door, uh, but right in this area here, about where her knees would be, okay. right in that area. Now, you mentioned earlier that you um, found an absence of any material on that um, south wall, would that be right? 
It would be the south wall of the uh, east-west hallway. Yes, there was an absence, and that's how, that's one of the reasons I came to that determination. If there was marks on that wall, I would have put her further down this way. But because that wall was completely shielded from any kind of debris hitting it, I was pretty confident that it happened past that, that south wall. Okay, and so you mean past this wall right here? Yes. And so somewhere beyond that wall is where she got shot. Correct. Um, do you know um, where the, like where, which way she was facing or can you make any kind of determination like that? I would say that she was heading toward the uh, master bedroom um, uh, in a southern direction. And the reason for that is because of where the wound was on the head. It was on the right side and we have all this debris coming out this way uh, toward that wall, toward this wall, toward this wall. And if it was any other way, I don't believe it could have happened that. And it couldn't have deposited those, that blood, the tissue, the oily deposits. They couldn't have been on those walls if she was facing another way. Court's indulgence. Previously shown to the uh, prosecution, what's well, been marked as defense proposed F through Q. I don't believe there's an objection. I move for their admission. F through Q. Yes. No objection, Your Honor. Okay. F through Q will be admitted without objection. May I proceed? Yes. Good afternoon, Mr. McPhail. Hi. How is retirement treating you? I'm still working. <laughs> um, in the time that you worked for Metro, I'm sure you know that you have developed a reputation as one of the finest crime scandals that ever worked at Metro. Did you know that? I didn't know that, but what an honor. Thank you. Okay. And you've worked a lot of crime scenes. Yes. With a lot of crime scene analysts. Yes. Um, certainly, you had a sterling career prior to retirement. You'd agree with that, right? Yes. Okay. Um, there are limitations, however. <coughs> no matter how good you are as a crime scene analyst to what you can accomplish at a scene. Would you agree with that? Yes. For instance, if Mr. Orham finally had enough of me talking and stood up and whacked me in the back of the head, there may be some forensic evidence left behind on the ground around us, right? With what? His hand? I don't know, a baseball bat. Baseball bat, yes, I would if, expect that. If he shot me with a semi-automatic handgun. Yes. And then ran out the door. Yes. You would expect that there were instrumentalities of what he had done left behind, right? Yes. And there would be actual physical evidence for my injuries, right? Yes, a uh, gunshot wound for sure. Okay. Would you agree with me that in that same scenario, he's finally had enough of me and he shoots me in the back with a semi-automatic handgun, and then all the instruments of the shooting, the gun, the casings, the bullet, are cleaned up and taken out of here, and the blood deposited behind is cleaned up, and it's not here anymore, you probably wouldn't be able to tell us nearly as much about the incident, would you? You're absolutely right. That'd be a very difficult situation. Okay. And as a crime scene analyst, the goal is to get to a scene as soon as possible after the incident, right? Yes. And to get to a scene that's been preserved to the best of the ability of those preserving it, right? Yes. Because if anything has moved within that scene, it can tarnish the investigation, right? Yes. And if things aren't preserved properly or documented and collected properly, that can make it really difficult to go back in time and depict what accurately happened. Would you agree with that? Yes. Okay. I want to direct your attention to your involvement in this case. You did not respond to the initial shooting scene, right? That is correct. You're familiar with a guy by the name of Gary Reed, now deceased, correct? Yes. You worked with him for a number of years. Yes. And you know a crime scene analyst by the name of Jeff Smith, don't yes. you? Yes. And you knew a crime scene analyst by the name of Chelsea Collins. Yes. Um, you're aware, as part of your involvement in this case, that they responded to the original crime scene. Yes. And they had the obligation, the duty at that scene, to document, collect, and preserve the evidence close in time to the shooting. You agree with that? Yes. You indicated to us on direct examination there were a number of things that were apparent to you when you responded to the scene that you photographed and that you collected, right? Correct. Certainly items of physical evidence that you located, right? Yes. In fact, that was pointed out to you by homicide detectives, right? The cartridge cases, yes. Okay, I'm going to talk to you first about those. You responded on the 15th 
of May of 2008, right? Yes. And at the time you did, you had information as to the event number of the original event. Yes. And you knew that that event had happened on the 8th of May. Right, a week before. You knew you were there exactly a week later, Yes. Correct? You talked to detectives about it, right? I don't know how much I did, but I'm sure it was mentioned, yes. Okay. At the time you testified on direct examination a moment ago, you indicated where the body of Sharon Randolph was lying. Do you remember saying that? Yes. You weren't involved in the investigation to know that that was Sharon Randolph, right? Correct. It was gained by photos. Somebody gave you the information of her name, though, right? Right. And prior to going into the scene, you talked to detectives about what may be important that you may be there to collect. Yes. Specifically, they talked to you about cartridge cases, right? Yes. You had an understanding that those were not discovered by crime scene analysts or detectives where they were at the time of the shooting on May 8th, right? Yes. All you did is say, that's the cartridge case you're referring to. I'm going to go ahead and impound that now, right? Yes. And prior to doing so, you photographed it as it was a week later. Agreed? Correct. Okay. Um, when you were present at the scene, you noticed, once you went inside, these oily deposits, right? Yes. And from your experience, you believe them to be cerebral fluid. Yes. Because it kind of has a almost unique appearance to it, right? Yes. It's thicker than water, right? Yes. Stickier. Right. And you can look at a stain on the wall and say, to me, that looks like cerebral fluid. I would say that, yes. You agree that it's easier to see with the eye than, as you just mentioned, to pick up in a photograph. Correct. Difficult to photograph, but easy for you to see that day. Yes. And you also indicated that there were a number of blood droplets contained within that cerebral fluid. On some of them, yes. And you could actually see that with your naked eye. Yes. And because of the color of the blood, it picks up a lot easier on a photograph. Yes. You actually got up on a ladder, right? Yes. And you looked at items of forensic evidence left behind high up on a wall. Agreed? Yes. They included fatty tissue, right? Yes. That's something that you would have looked for had you been there on May 8th, right? Yeah, probably. And if you'd have seen it, you would have photographed it? Yes. And you would have impounded it? Yes. If you'd have seen those blood droplets, you would have swabbed them, right? Yes. And you would have impounded them on May 8th, right? Yes. You also located hair up on the wall, right? Correct. And you photographed it? Yes. And you impounded it? Yes. Because it's important? Yes. You even located um, tissue on the wall? Yes. And you did the same with that. You photographed it and impounded it? Yes. Because that's important for a crime scene analyst to do, right? Yes. Okay. You said something interesting on direct examination, and that is as you looked up and down this hallway, and I'm going to flip this back around here, that N arrow at the top on states 214, that indicates north, right? Yes. This door, you walked in and out of this door, right? Um, yes. Okay. That's the door from the garage into that north-south hallway. Yes. And you walked up and down that hallway. I did. When you were there, that hallway was clean, wasn't it? The uh, floor area was cleaned. Um, I believe the door to the master bedroom was also cleaned off, so there was no blood on the, that at that time. Yeah, so you weren't there on May 8th, right? Correct. You looked at photographs of May 8th. Yes. So you had an opportunity to see that residence in the condition it was in on May 8th in the photographs. Yes. And you'd agree with me in those photographs, there's no photographs of those blood droplets, right? Yes. No photos of the tissue? Correct. No photos of the hair? Correct. No photos of the fatty deposits? Yes. I'm going to show you a couple of photographs here. I'll show you what's first in evidence is Defense F. Do you see that initials and personnel number there? Yes. You take a picture of that to document that those are your photos, right? Correct. Okay. And then the one I'm going to show you what's in evidence is I, you put a scale and some directionality arrows and some letter and number markings on some of those blood droplets, right? Correct. I'm going to show you what's in evidence is defense J. That's a close up of that same one. You see those even without zooming in on defense J, those blood droplets, right? Yes. They're obvious to you, correct? Yes. I'm going to show you now defense K. 
Do you see above the door there's a scale with all the arrows, letters, and numbers above that scale? Yes. And that's because all of the physical evidence you're referring to was above that height, correct? Above five feet eight, yes. Or, yeah. Was it six feet eight? My mind is slipping. It was either five feet eight or six feet eight. I can't remember. Okay. If you testified on direct examination and indicated in your report it was five foot eight, you wouldn't dispute that? I would not. How tall are you? I am six two. Okay. Roughly how far is it between your eyes to the top of your head? Say three inches. Okay. So for someone a couple inches shorter than you, me for instance, my eyes might be about five foot eight. Would you agree with that? Okay. You wouldn't dispute that, would you? No. Okay. You would agree all the evidence that you documented, collected, photographed, and impounded was above that height, right? Except for the cartridge cases, yes. Okay. And in fact, a better representation is in defense L. You see there's nothing on those walls below that. See that? Yes. Okay. In fact, those walls were clean of anything of evidentiary value when you were there, Objection right? Objection calls for speculation. Did you document, collect, or preserve anything of evidentiary value below five foot eight on those walls? No. I'm going to show you, you just indicated you reviewed photographs. What's in is defense N. I'm going to zoom in on this one. Do you see that little cartridge case right in front of the door? Yes. You saw that photograph prior to going on the 15th, right? I don't think so. I had no involvement in this case whatsoever until the 15th. Yeah, but I'm saying prior to going to the scene on the 15th, you looked at the photos from the 8th. No. Oh, you didn't? No. Okay. That was the first time I saw anything with this scene was on the 15th. All right, I'm going to show you a photo then zoomed out from the one I just showed you. Defense M. Do you see that hallway? Yes. Do you recognize that as the north-south hallway? Yes, in the north end of it, the garage door being uh, right here. That's the door to the garage right smack dab in the middle, right? Correct. You see the way that rug is kind of folded up there? I do. You had nothing to do with that, right? No. Do you see, on as we look at that photograph on the left-hand side, some items hanging on the wall? Yes. What does it appear to be to you? A uh, hat, sun hat. Like a big, brimmed, wide, maybe 24 inch by 24 inch? 20 inch, yeah, 20 to 24 inch, yes. Okay, let me ask you this. If there was a shooting directly adjacent to that hat on that wall, and there were biological materials as a result of a high velocity gunshot wound, could they be collected on that hat? Yes. Okay. Would you be able to examine them? Yes. When you went to that location on the 15th of May, was that hat there? I don't think it was. When you were there on the 15th of May, at the opposite end of that hallway, you agree you documented above eye level the number of arrows, right? Yes. At the bottom of that photograph, do you see that doorway? The door to the master bedroom? Yes. Yes. Do you see anything unusual about the carpet? Yes. Is there a big old piece cut out of it? Yes. When you were there on the 15th, did you see any blood on the floor? No. It had been cleaned up, right? Yes. Someone had been in there and cleaned up that whole hallway, didn't they? Yes. And it appeared to you from eye level down, everything was clear with no items of evidentiary value. Agreed? Um, yes. What about, I'm going to show you what's in evidence is State 55. Do you see that inside of the garage portion of the residence at 6517 Rancho Santa Fe? Yes. You see blood all over the floor? Yes. When you were there, was that blood there? I don't believe it was. I don't recall, but I don't believe it was. Okay. Do you see up at the top there some items laying just outside the door? Yes. Looks like a couple bags and a couple toolboxes. Yes. Okay. You photographed that same area when you were there on the 15th, didn't you? Yes. I'm going to show you Defense G. What's 
looks pretty clean in front of that door, doesn't it? It does. Okay. You'd agree with me that some of those items have moved, haven't they? Yes. You'd agree with me that the photograph that you took on the 15th depicts an entirely different scene than the one that was taken on the 8th, right? So there have been things moved. I would agree with that. And when things are moved in a crime scene where you're trying to document, collect, and preserve evidence as it was at the time of the crime, that can lead to some inconsistent findings, right? Possibly. And in this case, some of those toolboxes had moved, right? I think so, yes. The ground had been cleaned up, hadn't it? Yeah, it looks like it. Okay. The blood that was clearly there at both ends of that hallway and in between on the 8th of May was gone when you came, right? Yes. When you got there, there was actually other members of law enforcement present, right? Yes. You were called there by Detective Dino Kelly, correct? Yes. And when you got there, there was a homicide sergeant that was there, right? Albie, yes. By the name of Rocky Albie. You knew him, right? Very well. May he rest in peace. Yep. He's a great guy. He pointed out some items of evidence to you, right? I can't remember who did it. I, I, whoever pointed out the cartridge cases, it was somebody from the homicide team, but I don't recall who it was. And you impounded them? Yes. And you agree with me that because the area in which you impounded them from had moved in the last week, the cartridge case had presumably moved to? It's possible. It's certainly possible. Okay. You'd agree with me that a week later, after items have moved and been cleaned up, it has a lot less evidentiary value to you, doesn't it? It's a lot more. It's a lot more difficult to tell a story if something's been moved. Yes. Right. In other words, if you're looking at forensic evidence in order to prove or disprove a story, if it's been altered, it makes it a lot harder. Right. Yes. In fact, it's practically impossible, isn't it? It can be. Okay. Um, Detective Dino Kelly was present when you arrived, yes? Yes. So was Detective Cliff Monk. Not sure. I know Rob Wilson was, but I'm not sure about Cliff Monk. I'm not saying he wasn't. I just don't remember. Do you remember that they were conducting something called a walkthrough? Yes. And they were videotaping it? They had just finished when I got there. Okay. Just so it's clear, you notate in your report when you arrive and when you leave, don't you? Yes. Okay. And in fact, in your report... Can you tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury what you documented as your time of arrival? I believe it was, if I'm remembering correctly, it was uh, 9.17 p.m. Okay. Um, if I were to indicate the report said 9.16. My bad. Yeah. About the same. But you would agree with me that that time is documented and written in your report at yes. that time, right? Yes. You also document when you clear the scene, don't you? Uh, yes. And in this case, you documented that you left at 1.06 a.m. Is that right? That sounds right. Okay. You were there for a number of hours. Yes. And you were putting up all those arrows. Yes? Yes, I'm sorry. And you were photographing them, right? Yes. And it was pertaining to what detectives had told you, the area that was important in the case, right? I Honestly, I don't know that they told me anything was important. I prefer to enter something like that with very little knowledge of what happened so I can draw my own conclusions. I was probably given uh, some very basics of the scene, and uh, beyond that, I, I don't think anybody was too specific. Okay. I'm going to put on the overhead, and this is the last little thing I'm going to ask you. When you were drawing your own conclusions about what happened, when you were documenting the items of evidentiary value that remained a week later after the homicide, you would agree with me that you took photos of all of the forensic evidence related to blood or tissue or evidence of a shooting, right? Yes. Okay. You would agree with me that hat on the wall was gone, right? I think it was. I don't recall seeing it. If a hat had been there, would you have looked at it to determine if there was evidentiary value on it? Yes. Okay. I'm going to show you defense O. This is a still shot from that walkthrough video. You agree with me, the jury's already seen this video, 
you would agree with me that still shot depicts different items hanging there, right? The hat is definitely missing. The hat's been no. removed, right? Yes. And it had been removed prior to your arrival. <laughs> Correct. And as far as you know, that hat was never examined, impounded, tested. I, I never read anything about that. Okay. Do you see the door that's open in that photograph? Yes, sir. Okay. Did you look at the exterior portion of that garage door when you were there on the 15th? I don't recall. Let me ask you this. If the door was open as it's depicted in Defense O and there was someone right adjacent to that door and they were shot with a gun and a high velocity impact occurred, could you potentially find some forensic evidence on that door? You could potentially, yes. Did you ever look at that side of that door when you were there on the 15th? I don't know that I did. I can't say I didn't. I just don't recall. Okay. As you sit here today, you can't tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury that you looked at it, right? Correct. Uh, you, can, you can tell us the blood that was on the ground had been cleaned when you were there, right? Yes. And you can tell us the area in the exterior of that door in the garage had also been cleaned, right? The, uh, the only door I know of that was cleaned specifically would have been the master bedroom door. And I apologize if my question wasn't clear. In Defense G, that area outside the door has been cleaned, yes? Not talking about the door surface. The blood on the ground appears not to be there anymore, and I do not recall it being there that day. And it appears to be neat and tidy and swept up, right? Yeah, somewhat, yeah. Okay. And you agree there's no blood on that door that you can see in that photo? That I can see, yes. And you took that photo? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm going to show you the last thing, as I mentioned. This is stage 240. That's one of those blood drops, right? Yes. Very obvious, correct? Correct. You photographed it, yes? Yes. Do you see the texture of that paint? Yes. What do you refer to that as? Uh, just textured walls. And the paint itself is a flat uh, beige-colored paint. Okay, the texture, do you refer to it as orange peel? Oh, you know, I, I would have just learned something today. I, I just call it texture wall. Okay. Yeah. The texturing and the application of paint to it can strengthen that drywall, right? Yes. It would make it harder, for instance, to see a mark on it, right? No, I'm going to disagree with you there. I think the mark would be obvious, depending on what you're talking about. Um, a bullet strike or something is certainly stronger than that material on the wall, and it would show up. Okay. And the, pa the paint clearly depicts blood quite well. Yes. Right? And you'd agree with me, you didn't document, collect, or preserve any blood below eye level. That's correct. Um, in addition to homicide detectives and investigators that were present, do you recall any other people being there? Uh, Mr. Randolph was there. Uh, like I said, I caught the tail end of that interview we was doing where we walked through the, the scene. Uh, he, I didn't even catch the tail end of it. They were done by the time I got there. And uh, I believe he was there at some point. Okay. Do you remember anyone else being there? No. Does the name Colleen Byer mean anything to you? No. Okay. Um, how long did it take you to put up all those arrows? Well, I was there about three hours, and it took a good bit of time to document that. Yeah. Of course, until I think Mr. Orm's done as well, Judge. Okay. Uh, Thank you. So, uh, Mr. McPhail, when you were there on the 15th, um, you were, the request was made from Homicide for you to come out there, correct? Yes. Then do they limit you in where you can look or where you can work or what you can do to examine the scene? No, not at all. There's... Uh, do you kind of work independently from them setting up um, your own photography, your own process on how you want to do it? Yes. Did they restrict you at all um, in terms of where you could look for uh, blood or tissue or uh, strike marks or anything like that? No. Um, you were allowed to look all through that hallway and document whatever you wanted? Yes. 
Okay. Um, you talked about on cross-examination how um, everything you saw was sort of like 5'8", eye level or above, correct? Correct. If you had seen anything that looked like blood or uh, cranial fluid or a strike mark or anything of ballistic significance um, below that, uh, you would have been free to mark that, right? Yes. I mean, homicide wouldn't say, hey, we don't want anything below here. That's correct. Um, you, uh, had you seen something like that, that would have been something that was important to you? Yes. Um, and so, presumably, you documented what you observed when you went there on the 15th, what you yes. were able to observe? Yes. Okay. So, Mr. Tomshak to uh, showed you a picture of that, um, that hallway, and then there was like a hat kind of hanging on the wall? Yes. Um, would you expect like a, a secondary strike or some sort of mark um, on a wall if a, a shot was fired there and it, in, the, in the direction of the hat? The hat wouldn't have prevented anything from continuing to the wall. That's definite. So let's talk about um, cartridge cases. Um, I think you said you've been to many, many scenes. Yes. Um, have there been occasions when you've gone to a shooting scene where you happen to know the number of shots, but you can't find all the cases associated with them. Yes. Um, is, is that something, I mean, it's not ideal, but is that something that happens um, sometimes when crime scene analysts are at scenes? Those are the kind of things that kept me up at night, not the horrific things I saw, but what I might have missed. Um, they, it happens sometimes. I, out of all the many complicated cases I've, I've worked, all the scenes, I, I can't think of one that was perfect. And there's always something that keeps you up at night, and those are the things that do. And is it, um, is it because uh, the, case, the cartridge cases, uh, you know, they're small and you're in a crowded space and sometimes you just don't see them all? They get kicked. They end up being in things, uh, in grass, for example, in rocks, a rock landscape. In this case, uh, it was in a toolbox with a bunch of other small items. And so, yes, you, you do miss them sometimes. You're not proud of that, but it happens. Okay. Now, given the location um, where these were found, um, it kind of like back by that, the water heater and in that toolbox, um, that is, is sort of an area that um, you may miss if you, were if you were processing a scene? It's certainly possible they did. Okay. Yeah. Um, do, I mean, is there, I guess, do you interpret like any sort of possible movement of those between the 8th and the 15th given their location where they were found on the 15th? Objection, well, how many crime scenes have you been to? <laughs> Uh, hundreds, uh, thousands. Okay. Have there been occasions when you returned to scenes and found additional cartridge cases? Yes. And um, is sometimes that a day or two later? It's happened, yes. Okay. And based on that, ex based on that experience, um, do you have any opinion, I guess I should say, as to whether or not these cartridge cases appeared to have been moved from the 8th to the 15th? That's my well, he's an expert. Not an expert in what thing is happening. He's not there for a week. Can't have the bench. Based on the location where these two additional cartridge cases um, were found, one's like underneath, or well, the word, there's one in the in the toolbox that's sort of in one of the pockets for uh, tools, correct? Yes. Um, and it's underneath some, or well, uh, next to like I think it's a pair of pliers, or yes. something like that. And then the other one is sort of on a 
on the floor or on the floor of the garage near a bottle of water, kind of tucked back in the corner. Yes. Okay. Um, in uh, in your experience at crime scenes, it, are those the types of places um, that sometimes would be missed in a search? It's very possible to miss uh, cartridge cases. They bounce around a lot. Uh, they can be kicked inadvertently. It's easy to miss some cartridge cases. And and I think, you know, you acknowledge it's not ideal, but sometimes that happens. Uh, at, there's no perfect processing of any crime scene. Correct. You can tell us where the cartridge cases were pointed out to you on the 15th of May, right? Yes. You have no idea how they got there, right? Correct. You have no idea whatsoever if they moved between the 8th and the 15th, correct? I, I have no personal knowledge of that. Yes. Okay. You do have personal knowledge that you documented, collected, and preserved evidence on the 15th in that hallway. Right? Yes. And you also know that that evidence was missed on the 8th, correct? Yes. You mentioned a moment ago that the mistakes that can happen keep you up at night, right? Um, yes, but not necessarily mistakes. Things that I missed, which become mistakes, yes. Uh, things that I might not be able to understand at the moment, those are the things that keep you up at night. You would agree with me that the reason those things keep you up at night is because the things you're investigating can be so fundamentally important to a case like this, right? Yes. And if things aren't documented, collected, and preserved properly, investigators can reach the wrong result, correct? Yes. You would agree with me that when you went back on the 15th, Ms. Weckerly, when she asked you a question, you would have documented, collected, and preserved evidence of blood lower on the wall had you seen it. You agree yes. with that, right? Yes. Okay. You would agree with me you didn't see any, right? Yes. And you agree with me that that scene had been cleaned between the 8th and the 15th. Yes? Yes. Nothing further. Sure. The walls on the 15th still had um, tissue on them, correct? Correct. The walls on the 15th still had, well, actually the air conditioning vent had hair, yes. correct? Um, and there, was, there were markings of uh, cerebral fluid that you took samples of all along those walls. Is correct. that fair? Um, and all of that existed on the 15th. Yes. And had you found any other evidence that existed on the 15th related to um, ballistics or a gunshot wound or a secondary strike or uh, anything indicating or anything having any connection to your interpretation of where the, what took place in this hallway, you would have documented it, right? Yes. Thank you. The things that you documented, all of them, above eye level, right? Yes. Everything below eye level, no blood evidence. It wasn't there. There were no white marks either, as if somebody cleaned up that area. There was nothing there. I agree with you. There was nothing there, right? Yes. Okay. The arrows that you put up, did you take them down that night? I don't think so. I usually don't. Okay. Nothing further. Nothing else. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury,
Yes. Would you be able to determine from what position or location of the home was the shooter at when he fired at Sharon Rendo? I believed that he would have been near the bathroom door, as was she. It was a near contact wound to her head where they found soot deposits at autopsy that indicates the gun was near her. So I would put him near the bathroom door, maybe even inside the bathroom door. You mentioned on direct examination of the defect on the wall. Did you happen to swab that area for testing? No, I, I did obtain a, a hair and tissue sample in the general area. I did not uh, swab the area. As a matter of fact, um, after the projectile hit the wall there, it continued, ricocheted off that wall, and went to the pot shelves, and it was recovered that night on the pot shelves. There was two fragments of the bullet that night that was recovered, the, uh, not of my night, the night of the 8th. Why did they call you a week after and not the night of? I, I can't answer that. I'm sorry. I just don't know why they didn't. Okay. The <clears throat> State may follow up based on the juror question. Mr. Conte? No. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, do you have any other questions of this witness? Okay. Seeing no response, sir, you are excused. Thank you very much for your testimony here today. Can we approach real quick while she comes in, Judge? Yes. Your Honor, was I excused before? Do I need to uh, swear? You are. Oh, thank you. No worries. I'm just asking. No. <laughs> <laughs> Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Lisa Gavin, L I S A G A V I N. Thank you. Um, Dr. Gavin, we had showed you uh, a computer generated image um, that had um, trajectory patterns, um, and I think on your direct examination, you, you said one of them was slightly off, in your opinion, medically uh, as to the, its location. Correct. Um, I'd like to approach and show you. States proposed 330. Have you, um, well, I'll ask you, can you look at that image and see if it accurately uh, depicts the injuries? Location, I should say. Yes. Okay. And there's arrows on 330 um, that indicate directionality. Is that accurate? <coughs> Yes. 
Yes. And there are also um, uh, arrows, I guess, sort of the, depicting whether it's on the left side or the right side in terms of entry and exit um, that correspond with sort of the pointed part of the arrow. Is that accurate in your opinion? Yes. Is it anatomically accurate um, in terms of where these injuries were observed on Mr. Miller, uh, presuming the anatomical position? Uh, they're accurate for the areas of entry and exit and the directionality. Okay. State moves to admit 330. Same objection. Okay. That objection is overruled. 330 will be admitted. And that's put on the overhead. State's 330. Um, looking at that those are those depict the various entrance and exits on mr miller as well as directionality is that correct yes i'm going to actually uh, if i could approach again um and have you label the injuries by number if you could please on 330 and here's a sharpie and these are with the coroner's corresponding numbers correct correct okay. and again that doesn't mean sequence of in, of which they were inflicted And then, um, is there a way you, well, is there a way you could mark on here um, what one is the entry or what is the exit, or is that going to be based on sort of the arrow that's already on there? I think the arrow, imply, the arrow implies that. Okay. So let's look at 330. And... This is the, the first one that, that we discussed on um, direct examination is the one that enters, sorry, I always do it the wrong way, on the uh, sort of near his left ear and comes out um, on his right forehead. Correct. And the second one is the, the um, left forehead um, entry that's the one that's at that really steep angle that lacerates his tongue and comes out his uh, neck. Correct. And the third one is the abdominal one that sort of travels up his chest. Correct. Exits. Correct. And then injury number four is the one that was underneath the armpit area, and that's the one with no exit. Correct. And injury number five is the one that enters from the back of the sort of left elbow area and then comes through the front of his arm. Yes. Thank you very much, Doctor. Problem. You'd agree with me that states 330, that's not a photograph, right? Correct. It's kind of a animated, cartoony type representation of a human being, right? Yes. Okay. Um, and there's arrows that go across it, right? Yes. State asked you a moment ago if those accurately depict the injuries sustained. You'd agree with me there's no injuries on in that? Uh, correct animation, right? Correct. In fact, there's no entrance and exit identified at all, correct? Uh, correct. There's directionality arrows, as you previously testified to, right? Yes. Okay. Um, looks like our cartoon guy's wearing a belt and kind of some ripped jeans. You didn't make those decisions about how to dress up our cartoon guy, did you? No. Okay. But you've been shown this cartoon previously, right? Yes. In fact, you were presented with a cartoon on direct examination today by the state where you pointed out that their representation was wrong, right? Yes. And in fact, you had to leave to fix it and come back so you could testify to it, right? Yes. And if we're being honest about it, earlier today isn't the first time they showed you a cartoon representation similar, similar to this, right? Correct. A couple weeks ago, you met with the state in something called a pretrial conference. Correct. And they showed you a cartoon guy then too, right? Right. Okay. At that time, you said, hey, you got it wrong, you need to fix it, right? Correct. And even when they fixed it today, they still had it wrong, right? Uh, correct. You'd agree with me the photographs of the actual injuries and your testimony about their trajectory is accurate medically, right? The photographs depict the injuries. And your testimony about it is accurate medically, right? Correct. You'd agree with me that Cartoon Guy doesn't really offer much to uh, that testimony, right? The 
the trajectory. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma You agree with me that Mr. Animated Cartoon Guy here doesn't add anything to your medical testimony about the trajectory. Your testimony is the same, right? Uh, regarding trajectory, yes. Okay. And you'd agree with me that our animated cartoon man here doesn't actually depict a single injury, does it? Say again, please. Doesn't depict a single injury, does it? You're correct. He doesn't have injuries on him. Okay. Nothing further. So at the coroner's office, um, are there, um, occasionally do the doctors use um, blank drawings that are depicting, you know, sort of a generalized person in order to mark where injuries are? Yes. And this would be um, states 330 similar to that, right? That, and sometimes doctors will use those blank drawings to sort of put all of the injuries onto one image. Is that fair? Yes. And so stage 330 just gives you sort of a, a summary of the location of all of those injuries. Is that right? Yes. And while it doesn't have like the gunshot wound depicted on it, it certainly is accurate in terms of um, directionality and trajectory, I should say. Yes. And lo location of the injury. Yes. And then the, the arrows tell you where the entrance and exits are in conjunction, of course, with your testimony and the photographs. Is that fair? The length of it does, and then the point of the arrow indicates that direction. Okay. Thank you. Dr. Gavin, did you test the gloves found on Mr. Miller for gunpowder or soot? Our office doesn't test for any of those kinds of things. That's done by the crime lab. Dr. Gavin, can you state gunshot number five, the entrance wound again? It seems the arrow's going the wrong way. It's the way it looks in the photo because it's uh, facing towards you in that anatomical position, but it's coming in from the back of the elbow and heading towards you. And so that's why it looks like the arrow is pointing towards you uh, because anatomically it's going kind of back to front. Any follow-up based on the jury question? No. Defense? Not one. Anything else from the ladies and gentlemen jury have any further questions for Dr. Kevin? Okay, seeing no response, thank you very much, Doctor. You are excused. Thank you for your testimony here today. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, those are all the witnesses that we have for you today. I swear to you, we are bringing this to a close. I swear to you that we are getting close. So we are going to take our after our.
weekend recess. During this recess, you must not discuss or communicate with anyone, including fellow jurors, in any way regarding this case or its merits, either by voice, phone, email, text, internet, or other means of communication or social media. You must not rewatch or listen to news or media accounts or commentary about the case. You must not do any research, such as consult dictionaries, using the infra infra internet, or using reference materials. You must not make any investigation, test the theory of the case, recreate any aspect of the case, or in any other way investigate or learn about the case on your own. And you must not form or express any opinion regarding this case until it's finally submitted to you. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll be in recess until Monday morning at 10.30. All rise for the jury.